Great. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, this oversight hearing uh, of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. Uh, my name is Jimmy Van Bramer, and I'm very proud to be the chair of the committee. A uh, little housekeeping. Obviously, we've moved from the chambers uh, to the committee room because the Education Committee is running late, and rather than wait for that to end, uh, I chose uh, to uh, move here to this room, which is a little bit more intimate, so apologize for those who are standing, uh, so we could uh, roughly uh, go on time. Uh, obviously, we're very excited uh, to have uh, Commissioner Finkelpearl here and all of you here to talk about uh, Create NYC and where we go from here. Uh, I'm thrilled to be joined by Council Member Peter Koo, uh, also from Queens. We have some other council members who are on the way. And of course, uh, we also have two council members uh, who have had uh, uh, babies recently. So we have uh, some maternity and paternity leave going on. So our committee is uh, uh, blessed uh, to have those uh, new babies in our committee family. Uh, but we won't uh, have uh, the presence of Council Member Levin uh, who obviously is a co-sponsor of New York City's cultural plan, uh, but I want to thank him in absentia, although I know he's enjoying very much uh, where he is right now with his family, and of course, Councilmember Cumbo, who uh, recently gave birth uh, to a beautiful uh, little boy uh, who also can't be with us here today. Um, but uh, we will um, uh, now commence uh, the hearing and again, if anyone wants to sign in to speak, uh, we have the list up here. I see more people are coming in. And again, apologize for the uh, closeness of the room, but uh, we're a cultural community. We're close, and um, we'll make it work. Um, so uh, thank you all for your interest. Uh, thank you for being here. And as uh, many of you know, and hopefully everyone has read, uh, every single page of Create NYC, um, uh, this uh, very impressive document uh, that I'm proud uh, to see have come out of uh, the legislation that Councilmember Levin and I uh, passed. Uh, all of us know how important our community is, uh, how important artists uh, will always be in uh, the city of New York. And, uh, and everything that artists and the cultural community contribute is hard to encapsulate in one document. Uh, in fact, it's impossible. Uh, but this was uh, a noble effort. And I know the commissioner will speak a little bit uh, to what went into it. But obviously, we want to focus more uh, in this hearing on what's next. Uh, what's being done. Uh, obviously, there are some significant recommendations uh, uh, towards the end of this document, and we want to talk a little bit about those recommendations and what is being done to make sure that we uh, attain the goals set forth in the plan. Uh, and I'm anxious, of course, to hear from uh, everyone in the community about the plan, what your thoughts are, uh, where you think we should go. Uh, and of course, we're aware that any plan uh, will have its supporters, uh, and there will be those who maybe feel it doesn't go far enough, doesn't go deep enough. Um, and I'm interested to hear from everyone on where they might feel there are gaps uh, in what is being presented and what is in this document. Um, so uh, it's, it's good to be here uh, with all of you um, celebrating uh, this document, uh, but also, um, more importantly, to talk about uh, what we can do to address uh, in very, very substantial and meaningful ways uh, access and equity uh, and some of the challenges that we know the cultural community uh, are faced with in terms of diversity, in terms of uh, displacement, uh, in terms of all of the things uh, that everyone is, is um, working with. I do want to say at the start that uh, we once again secured uh, record funding for uh, culture and the arts in the city of New York. Uh, the commissioner and I um, both fought uh, incredibly hard and uh, 
and I know that some of the funding that we secured in this year's budget uh, is already uh, being envisioned and being used uh, to address some of the recommendations, but obviously I want to hear a little bit more from the Commissioner on how we're doing that and how we're putting your tax dollars to work right away uh, to make sure, once again, that we're addressing access and equity and making sure that uh, everyone is being served, everyone has access to the arts, everyone can participate in the arts. That is what we're all about. I want to thank uh, uh, Aminta Kilowan and Chloe uh, uh, Rivera, who are here with me, uh, our council, and Matthew Wallace and Andres Vija uh, from my office as well for their help, and uh, so that we can get going and stay roughly on time. Uh, I'll ask Commissioner Finkelperl to uh, read his testimony, uh, but before that, we will ask him to uh, swear that everything he is about to say is the truth. <clears throat> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Well, that's a relief. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Um, it's also a very serious room, everyone. If you, if you agree with anything or you want to laugh, you can actually do this, right? So why don't we uh, uh, exercise. Uh, how many of you think uh, arts and culture are incredibly important in the city of New York, right? How many of you would like more funding to be allocated to culture and the arts in the city of New York? All right. Uh, so with that, um, affirmation of the importance of the arts and a desire to see more funding, I give you Commissioner Tom Finkelbo. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Van Bramer and members of the committee. I am Cultural Affairs Commissioner Tom Finkelbrill here today to testify regards, in regards to the Create NYC Cultural Plan. I'm joined by a number of my colleagues from the agency. I'm here today to tell you about what is being done and what comes next. But first I want to give a quick overview of how we got to this point. The mayor signed the Cultural Plan legislation co-sponsored by Chair Van Bramer and Council Member uh, Levin in May 2015. We launched the public engagement process in September 2016. Over the next nine months, we heard from nearly 200,000 residents. More than 25,000 people showed up in, at more than 400 live events, and tens of thousands more participated online. A range of partners, advocates, activists, and other residents responded to the planning process and focused their efforts on getting um, it, the plan, to reflect issues important to them. And the members of the City Council are some of the most significant participants in our public engagement efforts, hosting town halls and welcoming participants at events across the city. Your participation meant so much to us and showed New Yorkers that you truly are listening to their concerns. <clears throat> As you all know, we released the city's first ever comprehensive cultural plan, Create NYC, in July. It was a milestone moment. We were so glad that we could host it in Chair Van Bramer's district at the Extraordinary Materials for the Arts. We're also happy that Council Member Levin there, uh, the co-sponsor of the legislation alongside um, Chair Van Braver was there. <clears throat> With so many cultural groups, advocates, artists, and other stakeholders in NYC's creative sector gathered in the same room as the Mayor and the First Lady, Charlene McRae, together we sent a clear message that equitable arts access is a top priority. On day one, we were able to announce new funding programs aimed at furthering the goals and strategies laid out in the cultural plan thanks to increased support from both the mayor and our partners in the city council. The mayor's funding increases allowed us to continue paying energy support for cultural groups and city-owned property, including Brick, Harlem Stage, Pregones, Puerto Rican Traveling Theater, and others. This is a diverse set of groups that are cornerstones of communities across the city, and we're proud to provide additional support, allowing them to increase access and programming for their constituents. We were able to increase funding for smaller cultural institutions, members of the CIG, members which are located in or serve low-income communities. This application is out and is due back to us in three weeks. Able to fund uh, language access programming so cultural groups can expand their engagement with the city's diverse populations. And increase disability access efforts at cultural organizations. As a direct result of the plan, our new Disability Inclusion Associate started just this past Monday. This position will help guide the agency's own internal and external efforts at being more inclusive of people with disabilities and the disability arts community. The City Council added uh, funding at adoption and is aimed at the goals of the plan, thanks to the leadership of the Speaker and Chair Van Bramer for that. 
For one, the Borough Arts Councils are receiving an additional $1 million to provide support for individual artists. Not surprisingly, affordability was the single biggest issue we heard time and time again in Create NYC Outreach. Supporting working artists across the city is, a criti is critical to maintaining our neighborhoods as fertile ground for creative activity and the benefits of it that it brings to our communities. The council funding also increased programming, programming funding by $4 million that will increase funding for all cultural uh, groups, meaning that's in the, the uh, CDF, but with special focus on smaller organizations. These small groups do remarkable programming, and these increases are incredibly impactful. We applaud the council for this expanded support. One of the most significant announcements we made at the launch of Cultural Plan is a new effort as part of our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, or DEI, initiative to track demographics, allow cultural organizations to report on their diversity efforts, and promote, promote diversity planning among cultural nonprofits. For both the CIG members and the 900 organizations that receive funding from my agency, we will collect demographic data on their staffs and boards. This data will be scrubbed of any information that could be used to identify individuals. Starting next fiscal year, we will also require 33 members of the CIG to develop DEI plans or policies or risk a portion of their funding. Let me, be, let me be clear, these efforts are not something that my agency is doing to the cultural community. In hundreds of meetings we had across, um, we had for Create NYC public engagement, and in countless conversations with organizations themselves, this is a top priority for all New Yorkers. We all understand how critical it is to cultivate cultural programming that reflects and speaks to an increasingly diverse population. What we're doing is working with the cultural sector to make sure that DEI efforts remain a priority so that cultural programming here in NYC can reflect its audiences, its artists, and its workers. As the 2016 uh, DCLA diversity showed us, we're doing better than the rest of the, of the US. We've got a long way to go towards achieving meaningful results. Create NYC also lays out a bold vision for reducing energy consumption at cultural organizations. Over one-fifth of DCLA's support at cultural organizations goes to fund energy costs at cultural groups in, current, in the current fiscal year. Our big institutions have unique energy needs to be both public-facing and while maintaining their collections inside. That's why DCLA is creating a new position specifically to work with cultural organizations to help them reduce their greenhouse gas emissions to create more sustainable city. This energy managed position, management position is open and currently posted on the city's job website. The Mayor's One NYC plan sets a goal for 80% reduction in all emissions by 2050, with a focus on the city's more than 1 million buildings of all sizes, types, and uses, including cultural. This new position at DCLA will work with cultural organizations <clears throat> and our capital projects unit to reduce energy consumption. As part of Create NYC, we have a goal of directing $5 million in capital funding to energy efficiency projects. Another milestone achieved was the launch of the Cultural Cabinet, a coordinated internal effort among agencies to troubleshoot issues and more effectively implement cultural programming across city agencies. While the city is the largest local funder for culture in America, DCLA is not the only source of funding for the arts, or even its largest. The Department of Education invests nearly $400 million in arts education for public school students each year. And a host of other agencies deliver services through cultural engagement. The Culture Cabinet, which had its first meeting just last week here at City Hall, will help us leverage these resources and make sure that we're working together to increase access for culture uh, for all of our constituents. Beyond, beyond funding increases and new initiatives, Create NYC also includes policy recommendations that various advocates called for in our public engagement. These include re-examining the city's cabaret law and creating an office dedicated to supporting nightlife and, um, and music venues. As you all know, I'm thrilled that the council and the mayor have joined together to move on both of these priorities. Just last night, the mayor and members of the council gathered at House of Yes in Brooklyn to sign a law creating the new nightlife office to serve as a point of contact between members of our vibrant, vibrant nightlife community scene and the city, something uh, we saw a major demand for. The administration also has voiced support for repeal of the cabaret law as long as strong safety precautions remain in place. These are just some of the most immediate actions that we have, been uh, that we have announced following the release of Create NYC. We look forward to building on this work and dozens of other strategies and recommendations as described in the plan. As we said before the launch, this is not something that will sit on the shelf. It's already sparked so many new conversations, coalitions, and support from the city and other resources. And this is just the beginning. 
The Citizens Advisory Committee, which included members appointed by the Council, will continue to advise, guide, and promote oversight uh, for implementation of the plan's recommendations. It will continue to host office hours with the Commissioner, which provided such a rich uh, point of engagement with New Yorkers throughout the planning process. Look for these uh, open office hours to restart later this fall. Thank you for your support of Create NYC and our city's vibrant cultural community. I am happy to answer questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner uh, Finkelpearl, and uh, apologize again for anyone who has to uh, uh, stand, um, but it's great to see so much interest in the cultural plan and Create NYC. I do want to acknowledge we've been joined by uh, some more of my terrific colleagues, Councilmember Elizabeth Crowley uh, from Queens and Councilmember Costa Constantinidis, also from Queens. Um, I'm sure it is just a coincidence, but all four of the council members are from Queens right now. Um, uh, we love culture and the arts in the borough of Queens. Um, so, uh, Commissioner, I wanted to uh, uh, point out a few things. Number one, um, you mentioned the council's work in, in allocating a um, uh, million dollars, um, uh, uh, an incredible increase for our borough arts councils uh, so that individual artists uh, uh, can receive dramatically more funding. Uh, I want to repeat that and emphasize that, especially in front of my colleagues, who obviously are a big part of uh, this and, and who supported uh, uh, all of us in getting that funding, and so uh, when all of our arts councils receive this incredible infusion, which then is going to go out to our uh, uh, artists, individual artists all over the boroughs, um, know that the council fought for that and made that happen. Also, the uh, four million dollars, uh, uh, which represents a big increase for the cultural development fund itself. Again, I just want to highlight uh, the emphasis on smaller organizations. Um, and uh, the real emphasis um, uh, uh, to get at, fund, and support, uh, in particular, many of our smaller cultural organizations throughout the five boroughs. I am enormously proud of the work that we've done uh, with that. I think that seeks to address, in part, uh, uh, some of the issues uh, uh, that face some of our smaller groups, um, and very, very excited that those increases will be uh, coming everyone's way, those who are, of course, uh, in the CDF at this point, but also the individual artists and the Borough Arts Council's huge increases. So uh, with that, uh, what you didn't speak to, I think, in your testimony very much was uh, the additional funding from the administration and how that funding will be used to address some of the priorities and some of the um, uh, targets and goals that you laid out in the plan itself um, and, and uh, if there are new initiatives that are coming right out of the plan and right out of that year of discussions and meetings and town halls, what are they and what are they seeking to address? Um, so actually, I, some of the things that I mentioned are the, where the money is going. Um, so from the administration side, the $10 million, uh, we did have $4.5 million going to the CIG with a twi the 12% increase for the smaller CIGs, 6% for the larger CIGs. Um, there's funding for disability arts access uh, and disability arts. Uh, so we have a new staff position I mentioned, but we also have funding that's going to go to organizations to either allow um, disabled artists to participate in, in exhibitions or plays or performances or to allow um, access for audiences. There will be funding that is going to go to uh, language access, as I mentioned, which will be uh, so organizations, let's say, who don't have the money in their current budget to provide translation services for a performance or translate a catalog or something like that can, can get funding for that. Um, so these are some of the uh, initiatives. There are some initiatives that actually haven't been announced yet, but are getting announced quite soon, which I can't say in public. There's the million dollars that's going to the um, energy costs for the what's called the Energy Coalition. Um, so those are some of the things that are being rolled out. They're directly in relationship to the, um, to the cultural plan. And there is funding that's going to be added also, in addition to the funding that you guys have thrown in, to the smaller groups, 
we are analyzing the uh, maps that were created through the SIAP study, Social Impact of the Arts study, which showed uh, areas of the city that had either very low arts participation and assets or the sort of mixed bag communities, which they call diverse and struggling, uh, to put additional money into those communities. For, and yes. So well, those are that, uh, so where the money is going to go. So if, if the top priority or the top implementation strategy uh, is to increase support uh, uh, for the cultural life of low-income communities, underrepresented groups, uh, which could include uh, and obviously does include underrepresented neighborhoods, neighborhoods yes. uh, that aren't uh, seeing as much activity uh, as they uh, rightly deserve. What specifically are you going to do to address that very top fundamental priority that you? Yeah, so I think uh, there. Out? I mean, I think there's a couple. First of all, I do think that the um, money that the council has provided, those bigger increases, those large, very 33 percent increases for the smallest groups. A lot of the uh, communities that are most underserved have smaller groups. And so by, um, by definition, a lot of that money is going to go into those communities. But there's also additional funding that we're putting in specifically targeted at those uh, communities with the lowest uh, support. Um, the other thing I'd like to say just is that the, um, there's going to be, and I didn't spe spell this out. It was spelled out at the news conference. It was not spelled in the testimony. The new CDF application, which we're working on right now, which we're going to try to finish in the next month and a half or two months, is going to have questions about how does your organization address issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. As part of the, um, you know, the, the evaluation process for all grants, I think that a lot of the smaller organizations, if you look at the diversity, equity, and inclusion, or the diversity study we did, it showed that a lot of the most uh, diverse organizations are smaller organizations, which are CDF organizations. And I think that those questions will inevitably also put poor uh, funding into those communities. Um, so uh, anticipating uh, maybe uh, uh, some of the criticisms, right? Um, uh, You've certainly seen and heard of some of the others who maybe uh, have a different uh, uh, cultural plan. Um, and what is what is your response to that? Obviously, we'll hear testimony uh, from no, lots so of folks. Look, I, absolutely, I, folks are here who will, I know, um, testify. The People's Cultural Plan was a very helpful document. There's stuff in there that I think was, you know, very much in concert with stuff that we uh, proposed. The People's Cultural Plan also calls for, you know, that uh, aspirational number. Really, it adds up with the 1% for art, I mean, 1% of the city budget, which would mean a $700 million increase to the Department of Cultural Affairs budget, which would require additional taxes, et cetera. Anyway, I just, I, um, I'm sure you will hear from them. I don't want to speak for a group that's going to speak directly to you. I will say that I met with Alicia Grion and some other folks since then who are members who people who have worked on the uh, on that people's cultural plan I want to keep an open dialogue I think there are good ideas in there and I fully respect that plan the plan that we did is based on um, the reality of, of city government uh, and by the way I, I want to say also it's amazing that the council put in an extra three and a half million dollars also into council initiatives this is the largest cultural budget, as you said, uh, Chair Van Bramer, that we've ever had. It is the largest cultural budget any city in America has ever had. We believe it to be the highest per capita budget of any city ever in America. So those are achievements that we should be celebrating. I'm proud of it. I'm proud of your contribution, our contribution, yes. um, which doesn't necessarily get to the finish line of some of the... Uh, okay. uh, yeah, no, I, I wanted just to, obviously, you know, I, I will uh, um, hear the testimony of, of all of the folks, including the People's Cultural Plan, um, but at that point, uh, while you often are very uh, generous with your time and say to hear it, uh, you won't be there to respond. So I just want to will be here. get yes. an additional yes. okay, uh, yes. uh, word in there on that. And, and uh, thank you for pointing out the Council's cultural initiatives. Uh, because again, working with all of our colleagues, um, uh, it was we who created the Cultural Immigrant Initiative, which is now over $5 million, um, uh, an incredibly targeted uh, amount of money uh, 
uh, that didn't exist uh, three years ago, uh, in addition to CASA and all of the other SUCASA. Um, uh, but again, the, the focus <coughs> with the, the new uh, $4 million, with a, uh, the groups with budgets of $250,000 or less receiving a 33% increase um, is uh, very significant. Uh, and the groups between 250,000 and 8 million receiving a 15% increase, um, also very significant. Um, while uh, obviously there's more to do, we are very proud of those uh, numbers, very proud of uh, the work that we're doing, and I want to thank the speaker uh, for, for joining uh, me and, and feeling very strongly about those uh, targeted percentages. I want to also recognize we've been joined by Councilwoman Helen Rosenthal uh, from Manhattan. Uh, so it is not just a Queens thing. Uh, we all love culture and the arts uh, across the city of New York. Um, so the, the DEI, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Initiative, there were a lot of questions at the press conference with the mayor about how that will actually be implemented and whether or not uh, any organizations will essentially be punished for, for not being diverse enough. Um, and to what extent or how deeply will that particular question or series of questions uh, be weighed? Uh, what will be the weight given to that um, uh, when groups are applying for funding? Um, obviously, that was an early announcement. I don't know if there's any more um, clarification I, on that. Uh, a little bit. So, I mean, basically, for those who haven't, Heard. There's there's the CDF and there's the CIG, and these are being handled a little bit differently. In the CDF, it's a new application question, which means every application will have a question about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how do you address it. So it's then weighed amongst all the other questions uh, that are at the, the CDF. The CIG, nothing happens this year. This year we spend working with the CIG, and I'm, I'm going to be, I think, attending a meeting quite soon to talk about this. I've, I'm in contact with the CIG. I've spoken on the phone to about two-thirds of the CIG directors about this already, personally. We want to understand what a meaningful diversity, equity, and inclusion plan for each institution is. And it's not one fi size fits all. It means a very different thing to do an initiative like that. Let's say it's Studio Museum compared to the Metropolitan Museum compared to the zoo, uh, wildlife conservation. So we want to talk to people what's meaningful, what's useful for your organization. We already have a program <clears throat> called Culture Stat, which holds uh, organizations accountable for having a certain set of policies. That and there's funding um, implications. If you don't, the, and this is done under the last administration, have a certain set of policies, there are funding implications. So there'll be something quite similar to that, where organizations are not at risk to lose their entire funding, but where there's actual funding implications involved and where, you know, by next year, around this time in the fall, when people submit their annual report to us, which is a very exhaustive document, they'll be required to have that as part of this culture stat. And will uh, all of the organizations then have a, a sense of what is both being looked for, mm -hmm. uh, what is being expected, and then also, if they were to fall short, what might be the, the consequence in terms of getting to exactly how much weight is going to be placed on that particular question? Right. So, so all of these questions are not 100 percent decided yet, but we are working. We want to make sure that we're working with the cultural institutions, not you know that there's some separate processes going on in terms of goals that everybody understands the goals. The other thing I want to just say clearly is we're talking about forward looking on these plans. So the question is not uh, simply what is the diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, sort of status of your organization, but sort of once the plan is implemented, what kind of actions are you taking going forward? Um, so we're looking at other cities. We've been very much in contact with Los Angeles. Uh, the British Arts Council has rolled out very similar, and they're much, much bigger than us. But uh, the next equivalent in the United States is L.A. County. Um, so we're trying to understand how they're doing it, uh, what are the best practices, what have they learned from their um, uh, information gathering in their initiative. So it's, we're trying to be thoughtful and collaborative with the cultural institutions. Obviously, I think that's uh, uh, very important going forward. Um, the, the goal, of course, is shared, I think, by, by all of us, and, um, and I'm sure every group uh, as well. But um, uh, having some transparency around 
uh, what's expected, uh, what's being looked for, and then what might be the consequences um, yes. uh, should folks fall short of what it is that uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs is looking for in terms of an answer to those questions. Absolutely, yes. Um, I, I wanted to uh, um, say one last question and then Councilmember Crowley and Councilmember Ku, I know have questions. Uh, I was at an event yesterday and, and someone um, uh, questioned uh, whether or not all of this was worth it. Um, the time, the energy, uh, the <clears throat> agita, and um, uh, could we and should have been uh, we spending uh, all of this time and uh, money on other things? Um, I, don't, I don't particularly share that view, uh, but uh, since much of that was uh, um, leveled at the department and all the work that, that, mm -hmm. that you all uh, entered into for the last year, um, what's your response so, to uh, that first question? Of all, I want to that say this that this was one colossal big waste of time, and, and we shouldn't have done it. It wasn't a waste of time, um, but I want to just say that that I've, you know, applied for money for my entire adult life from many uh, foundations, etc. And what I've seen happen at other foundations, I've seen it happen at Rockefeller and elsewhere, is when they're doing their planning, they stop giving grants for a year or two. We, my incredibly hardworking staff, you know, all the money got out to the groups. We didn't stop doing anything. We kept working. Uh, I was the busiest, uh, you know, period of my entire adult life. I've never worked that hard. I've been very hardworking. So I think it was worth it. Uh, I think at getting out, I think at the certain groups activating more so even than they had before. We saw that certainly in our ability to have good communications with disability and disability arts communities, that was fantastic. Same with the, um, the, the sort of DIY arts spaces, et cetera. There are certain groups, anyway, that, that have sort of formed around the plan almost, and I, maybe you'll hear from some of them. Not everybody is happy with the plan, but I feel it was absolutely worth it. And as you know, I was a bit of a skeptic a couple of years ago, uh, but absolutely I think I learned so much. And even just the idea of doing the open office hours with the commissioner, what Eddie Torres, who just left for a great new job, said, cultural affairs gets to talk to the cultural field all the time. This gave us an opportunity to listen to the cultural field for a period of time. We want to continue to do that. So yeah. I'm happy to talk to whoever this person is. I'm, you know. <laughs> well, I'm not at liberty to disclose that to information, Tom. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, <clears throat> that's I was that's what I was sort of looking for because obviously um, not only did we keep funding uh, the arts but we dramatically increased uh, funding for the arts while this was also happening and and I would think that what came out of this was a greater understanding of why it is we do what we do and 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 a real uh, reflection on how we could do it better and and if you the Department of Cultural Affairs the city of New York our committee come out of this with a better understanding of the community that we work every day to serve it was very much worth it and at the same time uh, to boot we kicked in you know nearly 20 million extra dollars for the arts uh, to make sure that, that we put some money behind the words and the documents and the intentions of the document agreed yes Councilmember Crowley. Well, I'd like to thank the commissioner and the chair for putting together this plan and executing it. I, uh, I'm interested in seeing uh, where, how far out you've reached. And uh, it's not surprising. It seems like the bulk, um, the closer you get to M Manhattan, the more uh, you are able to engage. And uh, I just want to make sure that uh, all community boards um, gets a greater level, especially because I think it's those that are further away from the core of the city that have a hard time accessing uh, culture. And it doesn't mean that they need to go into the city to do that, but uh, it probably means that they're most deprived and don't even realize it and don't even know to engage in such a survey like this to, to show that they are lacking in, uh, in the type of enrichment uh, provided by the arts. So I, my question it was in line, I was, you know, Jimmy sort of asked it before me, but I don't have a full understanding of, um, I remember last year or a little over a year ago, your agency was able to uh, 
understand the uh, diversity makeup of boards and realize that you know that they're they're too pale and not enough diversity and uh, so that you set forth goals for many of your partner institutions but you know a lot of city agencies are having problems with this too when contracting out giving awards and uh, they seem to have a, a obstacle so it's it would be better to understand um, how you, you could ensure diversity and, and whether you're really able to link it to funding, whether, uh, because it seems as if when we contract out in the city, we're having uh, yeah. a great big obstacle in, in doing so. Yeah, so I mean, I'm, by the way, very, I go to MWBE meetings all the time. I'm very aware of the issues that the city is facing and the goals that the city has set for itself. I wanted to say that our own diversity equity, or diversity numbers are publicly available, um, and all city agencies do publish that information. We do have a plan in terms of diversity at our, um, at our agency, so we're not holding our, anybody to the feet to the fire, who, which we're not doing ourselves. Um, the, it, so we actually, one of the things you said is we, so we actually have not set any particular goals at this point for organizations. We haven't said, you must do X, Y, and Z. What we've said is that CIG, by next year, will have to set for themselves their own goals. So each institution will be required to have a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. We're going to spend this year trying to figure out what kind of plans are out there, what kind of plans work. In my discussions with CIG leadership, many organizations are already working on these plans. And actually, some of them will have the plans this year, a year ahead of schedule. So it is. Um, you know, the goals, I don't know if you saw, there was an article in the New York Times recently about, it was about both staff and board diversity, and the board diversity issues were more severe than the staff diversity issues. So we understand that, we recognize that, um, but, you know, the, the question is how to get to the finish line. You know, this is a city that's two-thirds people of color today. This is not the future, this is the present. Uh, we need to acknowledge that and work towards that. And so I've, I've said this many times, I'll say it again in public, I'd like, if anybody has an example of an organization that's got a very diverse staff and doesn't have a very diverse audience and diverse artists on the stage or on the walls, I'd like to meet that organization because I haven't met that organization yet. So I feel like when people find diversity, I've seen it in organizations I've worked in, uh, as you know, in Queens, it's like <clears throat> things naturally flow from diversity in the in-house. So that's what we, we're very excited about working on. And just to, to make sure your plan is including all 59 community boards, mm -hmm. too. Because I, so even, yes, even, you it know, is. You, and you may have very diverse community boards close to the core of the city and still have diverse ones outside and then not be engaged as much, like Rockaway or so we had very, we had a lot of. I'm sorry. Uh, we had a lot of different kinds of input um, in the cultural plan. There was online, there was a public opinion survey, because you know, we got, it's one thing to get uh, opinions from people who come to meetings, there's another to do an actual scientific public opinion survey. We had online, we had in person, we did, uh, so I believe, is Nadia here? We covered all but one, or, yes, all but one community board, and I have to find out which that is, I should probably go to that community board. Uh, we got input from the entire city out of, you know, not necessarily equal number of people, but we did get input from every community board, but one. And that makes sure that uh, moving forward in the plan in terms of funding uh, and enrichment, we're still engaging all community yes. boards. Yes, absolutely, that's the goal. Thank for you. For sure, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Councilmember Crowley, and we're just gonna hope that it's not community board five uh, <laughs> in Queens, uh, the one that wasn't covered. Uh, Councilmember Koo. Thank you, Chair Rambema and Commissioner Fingerpill. Uh, thank you for your leadership in promoting uh, culture and arts in our great city of New York. Uh, my question is, um, has DCLA identified uh, the low-income uh, neighborhoods and underrepresented groups in which uh, you will increase uh, cultural programming? Because right now, I think a lot of, uh, uh, of um, Underprivileged groups, especially in the outer boroughs, they have never gone to the Lincoln Center or Carnegie Hall, or, or they have never seen a performance uh, of a symphony or, or, or Broadway show or, 
or, or those recitals, you know, uh, it will be great for them to have opportunities to go there to see a full you know, uh, professional performance. So maybe you inspire some of them, they, they become musicians or artists. So how do we increase programming uh, for those outdoor ball uh, groups? Yeah. So there's a couple of different answers to that. And by the way, I do want to, as Council Member Ku uh, knows, we, we did go to different neighborhoods and do focus groups in different languages as well. So we did a ma Mandarin speaking at Flushing Town Hall. Thank you, Flushing Town Hall is here, uh, which was a really good and very enlightening yeah. moment for us. So, and we did it in other languages as well. So th there are different ways to answer that question. So that one is that we did the University of Pennsylvania think tank, Social Impact of the Arts, came and spent two years analyzing millions of data points to understand which communities in New York City had more or less cultural assets and cultural participation. So we do have some maps. We could share that with you if you want to take a look at those parts of the city that, that are the most underserved culturally. <clears throat> There's no such thing as a cultural desert. There's cultural activity in every part of New York City. But there are communities that get more assets. And so we are focusing some funding on those neighborhoods. But also, as Council Member Van Bramer said, if you, the smaller groups also tend to be the groups that are in uh, other parts of the city, not Center City or Central Brooklyn, Central Manhattan. So the idea of uh, increasing by 33% those smaller groups, that itself also identifies uh, or gives money to, to the smaller groups in all over the city. So there are a couple of different ways. One is locational. One is sort of by the nature of the kind of organization. Is there a way we can like, reimburse some like, uh, like, like uh, orchestras? Hey, you know, give out some tickets uh, to uh, some public schools. You know, give, you know, they, they won't sell all the tickets anyway. I mean, they, they must have some empty seats. So you, you utilize those seats uh, so we, to we, increase the uh, attendance. So you're by, talking about a kind of a ticket distribution program? Yeah. So we don't... So we don't do programs. We fund programs in general. Uh, we have done some, we have funded some ticket distribution program, especially through the Theater Subdistrict Council. But I will say also uh, the public theater, for example, goes to different parts of the city. And last year, for example, I was one of the people distributing those tickets to Shakespeare in the Park uh, at um, the point up in, in the Bronx. So that was a moment in which we were able to get out there uh, and, and cultural organizations are doing exactly what you're saying. To, to go to different parts of the city where people might not naturally, you know, run down to Manhattan to get a ticket, but to get a ticket for Shakespeare in the Park, which is free. So it's a free distribution of tickets. That does happen. There are free distribution programs. Uh, but again, we're not, we fund the public theater. We have funded through Theater Subdistrict Council theater, uh, ticket distribution programs. But we're not, we're not the ones actually handing out, uh, you know, we're funding this. Thank you very much, Councilmember Ku. Uh, and uh, because we have so many folks who uh, would like to weigh in, obviously this will not be the last hearing we have on Create NYC. Uh, we are going to uh, thank the commissioner um, for his time and start with our first panel of four. They're going to be three minutes. We're going to be on the clock. Uh, and uh, we want to hear from all sides. So we're going to start with a panel that includes Marta Moreno Vega, uh, Charlotte Cohen, um, Ariel Estrada and Sheila Lewandowski. you flip a coin on how, who would like to start? <laughs> how about in the order, the order that I called you, if we can all remember that? Yeah, okay. All right, Marta, you're up. Good afternoon. And I'd like to start first by thanking the council for uh, the efforts made to increase funding. I think that's ex extremely important. 
But I think that in the process, we have to look at the framing of issues and the framing of language in terms of affirming racial equity, cultural equity, because I think diversity is being used and it's not being defined. So um, my presentation focuses on the framing of the narrative of policies of erasure for, na for racial non-white communities while affirming policies and practices of Eurocentricity or white supremacy. I think it's important to note that the study uses terminology that appears inclusive but lacks the details and practices of implementation to shift past and existing funding inequities. Using buzzwords that simply change but cloud the details requires a shift in the distribution of funds. Using diversity to imply racial and cultural uh, justice is not present in the plan. In the forward of the report, the erasure belittling of the work that community-based groups have accomplished continue to be identified as grassroots driven by communities' needs and simple love for what they do. And this does not address the fact that these institutions are at the front line of dealing with racial uh, situations, dealing with education, dealing with frontline issues that are within communities and are the purpose and should be the purpose of art. Art as transformative, art as activists, and art as empowering people. So in categorizing grassroots, provides a lower scale definition, lessening the equity and the quality of the programs being set. The 33 groups that are considered CIGs uh, are defined as bringing scientific research and experiential learning and grand scale experiences. So that already the dichotomy of who's grand, the 33 organizations, and more than 900 organizations funded by DCA are considered less than. So that if you use that dichotomy, then funding just, is justified for the grand institutions and minimalized for the smaller institutions. So that when you're dealing with a city that's primarily comprised of people of color, racial groups that have an extreme diversity within and across, including diversity of, of uh, disabilities and, and different types of disabilities, we need to better define what we're talking about because the cha change is in the details. And the terminology used by DCA at this point is just general. So that I would say that the grassroots definition, for example, uh, within the 33 CIG groups, El Museo del Barrio, which I directed, I was the second director, Studio Museum in Harlem are grassroots organizations, yet they're in the 33, which is good. In that, there was inequity. El Museo del Barrio and Studio Museum was getting less money than the other 31 organizations. What defines them as grassroots is that they are grounded in community, relevant to the communities they serve, and institutions and in communities that need more expansive services in the arts. So uh, uh, your time is up, but I just want to ask a couple of questions. So I understand uh, language is important, um, and, and I believe that, but um, do you really believe that the Department of Cultural Affairs believes that the 900 or so program groups are in fact the other less important, not as grand as the cultural institution group? Members? I'm not saying it, the report says it. Right, I understand what you're saying, but I would imagine- The report says it, that provides the justification for an action. What I would, but I'm, so, because I'm guessing that if Tom Finkelpart were back up here, he'd be like, no, 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 no. We would never, ever mean to imply, nor do we believe. But it is said in the report. I know. That's why I'm asking you what you believe. 
No, it's not a question of belief. It's a question of what's written down and what's going to drive action. Okay, so then if we, so then if we believe that the terminology and the wording in the report is is inappropriate or in that, uh, inequitable in terms of framing okay. the, the cultural picture. And I get the, that wording is important and language is important, right? Um, but uh, does that then negate uh, the good that's in the report, right? The, 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 the work that I think went into the report that was meant to tackle it. No, what that does, Jimmy, is the following. Now that there is increased resources, and it should have happened without increased resources, because what we're talking is about policies of racial equity, cultural equity, of identity, right? That services all of our communities. So that that language is what drives. That's how we communicate as human beings. You can't have language that is policy and go to your belief. You have to go to what is written, because that's what policy is. So what I'm suggesting is that given the opportunity to look at the report, that the report and the wording and the terminology and the definitions be changed. For example, the acronym ALANA absolutely erases saying African American, Native American, Asian American, Latino American. It erases it. That's called erasure. And that's the language that's in the report. And there's the opportunity to change it and to change the framing of it. And we should do that so that there is a, a constructive and systemic way of changing the language and the practice, because the practice ultimately is how resources are distributed. Um, I know that there are members of the Department of Cultural Affairs staff who are still in the room. I think. Uh, 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 the commissioner is not, but uh, I'm sure they are uh, taking note of all of this, and, and I think these are good questions to take back to the Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, language is important, um, and, uh, and, and that I certainly agree with you on. Um, I want to hear from the others uh, as well. Um, of course, I have now forgotten which order I called you in, but there you go, Charlotte. Thank you. I'm Charlotte Cohen, Executive Director of Brooklyn Arts Council. Thank you for hearing my testimony today, and thank you for allowing us to quantify and qualify the city's cultural sector to make sure all New Yorkers have access to the arts. Thank you particularly for the increase in DCLA's budget so that the Borough Arts Councils can be a closer partner with you to implement this important plan. Uh, particularly for the funding for individual artists that was mentioned and for the council's initiatives. Uh, the councils, uh, the borough arts councils are the pipeline for helping city government engage with local communities on a profound level. Art is community and artists are at its core. Today I'm focusing on an aspect of the cultural plan that relates very directly to Brooklyn Arts Council's work. We are at the forefront of building infrastructure for the arts in low-income communities. We reach deeply into local Brooklyn neighborhoods to engage community members and make sure they have access to the cultural offerings inherent in their own areas, as well as from other cultural resources. We've helped build coalitions comprised of neighborhood-based arts groups and individual artists in East New York, Brownsville, Cyprus, Hills, East Bushwick, Canarsie, and Flatbush. It's a model of working that's at the center of our vision for healthy, vibrant communities. In these cultural, culturally rich, yet physically fragile and economically unstable neighborhoods, we respond to local conditions and engage local residents, businesses, and community organizations. In our Brownsville Photo Voice program this summer, and that uh, catalog I uh, passed around is from that program, uh, we engaged almost 30 teenagers, not only, um, and they not only learned how to take photographs, but they were introduced to associated career opportunities by visiting a photo editor at the New York Times and the CUNY School of Journalism, for example. 
They also learned the life skills necessary to pursue those career options by working collaboratively and on assignment, if you will. The photos they took were about their neighborhood from their own perspectives, not those of the media or outsiders. And their images appeared on local photo murals as well as in a professional catalog um, that you're holding. They were also invited to participate in a public panel at the Photoville Festival in Dumbo last week. These students are examples of success affecting um, their own community positively. And this investment at a local level by Brooklyn Arts Council will help the city retain talented young people and encourage them to contribute, not to leave their communities. Um, I Thanks. could continue, <laughs> but my time um, is up. Yep. Um, I think that was powerful uh, enough. Um, this is great. And Thank you. Did, uh, were the young people um, able to use cameras that you supplied, or did they have yes, their own? Yes, and they got to keep the cameras as well. OK. So these are the types of programs that correlate exactly to the cultural plan and its goals. Um, and we look forward to partnering with DCA and with uh, the council to implement them. Right. Thank uh, you. Great. And um, I just looked at my, my notes here. and, and uh, the Brooklyn Arts Council is slated to receive a very significant uh, increase this year, uh, which I'm really proud of. Um, who's next? There you are. All right. Hello there. Thank you, Charlotte. Hi. My name is Ariel Estrada, and I'm the manager of communications and community engagement at the Asian American Arts Alliance. I am an, also an actor and a longtime arts advocate, but this is my very first time uh, presenting a formal testimony at a hearing, and thank you for hearing my testimony. It's so you can channel your acting skills yes. and, <laughs> and, and suddenly you've done it a million times, right? Uh, it's great. Um, You're doing great so far, though. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, Majority, Majority Leader Van Bramer and members of the committee, all of us at the Alliance welcome this opportunity to work with you, the entire City Council, and the DCLA to help transform the cultural panel plan from just a document into a real mechanism for making New York City a more equitable, just and vibrant city through the power of arts and culture. We are grateful to the Council and the DCLA for your leadership in creating a plan and prioritizing a number of issues that are especially important to us at the Alliance. One, that arts and culture are for all New Yorkers. Two, that funding should be distributed more equitably, especially to under-resourced and historically underrepresented, underrepresented communities. And three, that the staff and leadership of the arts and cultural sector should more fully reflect the diversity of our city's population. For 35 years, the Alliance has been working hard to address these three priorities, and we could not be more pleased that now, through the cultural plan, that there is a mandate directly from the office of the mayor that we all work together across sectors to tackle these complex issues. But the next steps must, inc must include actionable, realistic plans forward, as well as appropriate funding and resources to make the plans a reality. The cultural plan cannot be achieved by expecting more people to work harder and to build more partnerships, all for free. In particular, the Alliance urges the Council, the Mayor's Office, and the DCLA to provide the necessary resources to, one, lower the barrier of access to funding resources to small community-based organizations and individual artists. For example, the plan cites increasing regrant programs through Borough Arts Councils, which is an excellent start. However, we urge that this circle of partnership be increased to include other partners and service organizations, especially smaller ones that serve specific communities, including the Alliance. Two, instead of focusing primarily on diversifying boards and staff of major cultural institutions in a vacuum, meaningfully, meaningfully engage small community-based organizations that have been doing this work directly on the ground for decades. We're here, we have knowledge, we have credibility and trusted relationships and we want to work with you. And finally, three, be open about to thinking of and valuing leadership in new and creative ways. There is always much talk about the pipeline of leadership and how they aren't qualified enough, that there aren't enough qualified candidates of color in the cultural workforce. We beg to differ. This is New York City, which is already 65% people of color. We're here and living and working already in leading in the community. Please engage us. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I always uh, 
love when uh, uh, folks come and testify and actually have um, bulleted recommendations. <laughs> um, so do you feel that Create NYC did engage uh, uh, both the alliance and they the communities did. that you represent? In fact, in fact, uh, my boss, Andrea Louie, is actually uh, featured in one of the photos in there. And we were definitely engaged. Um, we're talking more on the, pro on the programmatic level. Um, for example, uh, one of our programs is the uh, J.D. Wong Dance Award that we've been doing for, for years now. Uh, and fun fact, J.D. Wong, um, before she passed away, was one of my first agents in New York City when I moved here <clears throat> 20 years ago when I was a young'un. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, we've been doing this kind of work for a long time and working directly with, with emerging Asian American artists. And, you know, we have the knowledge to be able to help the, uh, the council uh, reach out to these communities. Um, one of the things that I know that we would love to be able to expand out to is working, for example, with, with, um, with Muslim communities and with, uh, for example, there's a Cambodian community out in Queens that we would love to be able to engage with. But again, we don't have the kind of resources that, um, that would enable us to reach out that farther and to out to these communities. So these are the sort of things that with direct council support, we would be able to uh, expand out to. Because right now, I mean, in, quite, in all honesty, I feel like we have, it's, uh, I think somebody brought up earlier about that there's a, <laughs> that the, basically the closer you are to, to Manhattan, the, the more funding you're gonna get, uh, or the more help you're gonna receive. And we'd like to, you know, disrupt that, that what we feel is a kind of an old trope uh, in terms of the funding and really start to reach out into communities we haven't, you know, engaged with in the past. Right. Um, so, uh, because you mentioned uh, uh, the Borough Arts Councils, there's uh, every pot of funding that we have is increasing, right? Uh, sure. Literally, every pot of funding that we have is increasing. Yes. Um, uh, are you not eligible for any of those pots, or? I believe we are. We're eligible, for, and we're definitely apply, doing a lot of applying for those pots. Um, it's, you know, it's a, traditionally in the past we have, uh, we've, there's been a struggle to get that uh, recognition, uh, particularly from the arts councils. From the from the arts councils, We're, we've been definitely been funded by the DCLA, um, and we are going to and we we hope to continue very much to continue that relationship. And we enjoy it. Um, we are. Again, it's a matter of what we're able to fund and how we're able to reach reach out to them. And I think right. um, even working with, uh, you know, just even woodshedding here, being able to work with, say, the Bronx Arts Council and being able to create those kind of relationships. It's the kind the, unfortunately, the funding, since it's going directly to the arts councils, means that we, uh, rather than to some of the smaller groups out in the, who are working in the trenches, um, directly to us means that uh, we have to do <laughs> we have to do a lot of work to get the attention of the councils essentially right so well we can uh, I mean I, I'd, I'd like to adopt the strategy of, 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 of a thousand flowers blooming and and sort of everybody winning um, which includes the arts councils um, uh, um, I was once the president of the Queen's Council on the Arts uh, before my elected career and um, and certainly want to build more bridges and make sure that you're working together more collaborative, collaboratively. But I believe that uh, we can we can uh, really dramatically increase support for both the arts councils and and their constituencies, including individual artists, while also increasing uh, everyone's CDF grants. Then also increasing access to CDF and to all the other. Uh, pots of uh, funding, including the Cultural Immigrant Initiative, which I think you do get. Yes, right? we do. We do have that. Right. Um, so uh, we can we can get. Uh, I think to everyone. Uh, I hope. But I appreciate your your testimony. Um, Thank you, Sheila Lewandowski. Um, before. Before I start, I'll say, as you know, I don't usually read testimony, but today I am, because I'm not here representing the Chocolate Factory. I'm here uh, as a board member of New Yorkers for Culture and the Arts. So, thank you, Chairman Jimmy Van Bramer and the Council, Mayor de Blasio, Commissioner Finkel Pearl, and all of your staff for the incredible vision and leadership and hard work on the cultural plan. As I said, my name is Sheila Lewandowski, co-founder and executive director of the Chocolate Factory Theater. 
But today I speak to you as a board member of New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. That came out of a merging, a progressive merger between 1% for Culture and the New York City Arts Coalition. So we've joined forces and created a new organization that is chartered and committed to help secure the resources needed to sustain artists, cultural organizations, arts ed, and institutions, as well as the cultural workforce at large. Our comprehensive efforts are to ensure a vibrant future for culture and the arts through New York, throughout New York City through advocacy, strengthening of, the, of public policy, and funding for the arts, and through advancing equity, diversity, and inclusion to benefit all New Yorkers. We believe that culture and art are the essence of cultural vitality and enrich the lives of every New Yorker and attracts friendly visitors from every part of the world. New Yorkers for Culture and the Arts endeavors to speak for the workers, institutions, community organizations, artists, arts educators, businesses, and all that comprise this very diverse cultural sector. We, all of us, are critical partners in this public service. This planning effort, the cultural plan, has generated great interest and momentum in the cultural community, and this process has energized and engaged hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers across every borough. Culture and art are connected to every aspect of life in the city, including housing, education, affordability, economic health, racial and cultural understanding and equity, and the planning process has helped us to recognize, and we need to push further to recognize all of the voices, needs, and aspirations set forth as was in the People's Cultural Plan. We believe Create NYC establishes a framework for continued dialogue, but more importantly, creates a framework for action. Moving into the next budget cycle, we now have sound basis for increasing support for culture and arts in a way that provides equitable funding while also recognizing and celebrating our diversity. The plan makes a strong case for increased city funding for culture and arts. That being said, we understand this plan represents a beginning and is the start of a richer conversation. We also know that culture and arts are in the hearts and minds and lives of all New Yorkers and are essential to the well-being, emotionally and economically, of all our neighborhoods and all our people. We look forward to the process yet to come and plan on being a passionate advocate for all New Yorkers to ensure our city continues to nourish one of its greatest natural resources, all of us. Thank you uh, very much, and um, I appreciate you're mentioning that this report makes the case for cultural funding. That was, of course, one of the reasons that I supported it so much and believed that it could actually uh, create a mandate uh, for more meaningful support uh, and more stable support of the arts uh, because we have increased funding uh, dramatically over the last uh, several years, but we uh, still have yet to baseline uh, that funding, and that is one of our big efforts, and so we are really thrilled the Department of Cultural Affairs and, uh, and the Mayor's Office uh, believe in this report, and of course it'll be my never-ending argument that this report should lead to increased funding and all that funding should be baselined um, and not threatened the next time there is a downturn in the economy when everyone says, oh, we, that was great while it lasted, but now we're going to take all that back. Um, uh, we can't have that happen. We can't go back. Um, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Sheila, and to the panel. And um, uh, I would ask uh, if anyone has any uh, thoughts, uh, including uh, Marta, on what the plan got right. Um, uh, uh, what what uh, do you think is the most important thing to come out of it? That every, that every person in, in the city cares and wants this and needs this. I mean, before we had this plan, before we stepped out, there was not a collective um, gathering of voices saying this is critically important to this city. I mean, to me, that's something that this plan has gotten right. It doesn't mean that every word is right. And I agree with what Marta said about like grassroots versus community-based and things like that. Some of the verbiage is still um, div divisive, but it, it's, there's no one in this city who doesn't need and want this. And to me, that's something that it's a start of something right. Well, I think that what it recognizes is that every community Take a microphone, has culture. Marta. Yeah. Every, what it recognizes is that every community has culture and every community has creativity. 
And that's extremely important because the report itself indicates that they were surprised to find culture and art in communities, right? And that addresses the assumption that because people are not on the radar, that art is not happening. Mm. And what it does testify is that art is happening everywhere. I am absolutely thrilled to see that the plan um, starts to move um, money and attention away from sort of what is considered high art, art institutions like the Met or the bigger museums and start to move it towards, you know, towards the, towards, back towards the community. That, again, to Martha's point, that there is art happening everywhere in, this, in every, every borough. Um, I agree with my colleagues and also uh, appreciate some of the issues that were raised around um, needs for disability and language inclusion. Um, and so some of the really, you know, importantly highlighted um, areas, uh, as I mentioned, low-income neighborhoods very specifically, and particularly individual artists being at the core of all the work that we do. Uh, I agree. Um, thank you all very much for uh, being here for your thank role you. in all of this, and um, I appreciate uh, you taking the time. Uh, next panel is Mark Rozier, um, Naifa, Lisa Robb, uh, Center for Arts Education, Ginny Lulutis, Art New York, and Todd Stoll, Jazz at Lincoln Center. Mark, why don't you start off? Okay. And we'll go right down the line. No. Is the red light on in front of you? Yep. There. There you okay. go. Uh, thank you, Chair Van Bramer and members of the committee, not simply for calling this hearing, but for spearheading the city's first ever cultural plan. Um, it's a wonderful document and one that is completed in an impressively brisk period of time. NIFA was deeply involved in providing information for the plan. We held numerous focus groups, arranged in office hours with the Commissioner for Immigrant Artists, and forwarded the survey to literally thousands of artists working in all disciplines. I'm very pleased to see that the concerns of our constituents raised are, concerns our, concerns our constituents raised are reflected. Specifically, affordability, understanding and acknowledging the critical role individual artists play in the city, increased language access, increased support for underrepresented communities and arts and education, and the variety of equity initiatives. Coming from an organization with two disabled board members, I was also delighted to see emphasis placed on accessibility for this community. The values espoused in the plan are very much the values of NIFA and our constituents. We are committed to expanding the scope and reach of our services, diversifying our staff and especially our board, and reaching artists of all ages, disciplines, ethnicities, races, religions, and gender identities, regardless of their citizenship or immigration status. We provide services in multiple languages, in geographically underserved communities, and to, to artists of color who are not traditionally have access to such resources. It is heartening to see the city so forcefully committed to achieving these same goals. I am especially impressed the way DCLA has outlined a timeline for activities and prioritizes those to implement, promote, or explore. This seems a thoughtful approach to a plan of this scope and ambitious ambition, and we look forward to working with DCLA and other city agencies on execution. We are grateful to the Council's dedication and that you have allocated additional funds to move the plan forward. We hope it is a commitment which will remain for the foreseeable future. The funds provided should cover not only the initiatives outlined, but added resources to DCLA as well. The plan is strong, the timeline is reasonable, and the support needed to realize it must be adequate, continuous, and long-term. Thank you for your steadfast and visionary support of the arts community, and especially funding to the Arts Council for increased support to individual artists. Thank you. Um, and I made the case for baselining before your testimony. Right, we're, but yes. We're thinking alike. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
Thank you for the opportunity to continue to participate in the work around Create NYC. What a great um, job Hester Street and DCLA did on gathering us many, many times and many hundreds of thousands of others. I'm Lisa Robin. I'm the Executive Director at the Center for Arts Education. Uh, on behalf of our staff and the board and those we serve, big, big, big congratulations to the Council and the Mayor, the Advisory Committee, DCLA, government agencies, organizations, and members of the public for this historic accomplishment. From the beginning of the process, arts education for students has been a central issue of the plan. And in the workshops and the final document, we learned arts education is important to the public too. The very first headline in the executive summary on page 11 of this plan sounds like a sweet melody. This is what it says. New Yorkers believe that quality arts, culture, and science education must be available for every student. This is the very first headline in the executive summary, and we applaud it loudly. We applaud the plan's consistent call to bring more quality arts education to New York City's public students and by relation to their school communities and their families. This month, 1.1 million students were welcomed back to 1,800 schools. We are the largest school district in this country. We should not forget the power and the promise that New York City's arts learning requirements bring to advance and support Create New York's issue areas and strategies. There are rigorous arts education learning requirements in pre-K through 12th grade, and this presents a long-term giant opportunity to advance the goals of this plan, as does baseline funding. The city's focus on citywide coordination, I'm sorry, the plan's focus on citywide coordination also strengthens support for student learning and social well-being. There are dozens of city programs and agencies and thousands of nonprofits that invest in student potential and equitable educational opportunity for all students. Engaged and successful students help themselves and the rest of us achieve our goals and dreams. In the budget process for next year, as the year passed, unrelenting efforts must be made to reallocate and increase funds which support the plan's recommendations. There is one gorgeous arts learning budgeting opportunity on the horizon I want to bring to the committee's attention. Mm. At the end of this school year, 2014's four-year budget funding for arts education will expire. At another time, we will celebrate together how well-managed and impactful that $93 million has been for students, cultural organizations, artists, educators, and the school community and its families. So many parties from differing and, in fact, competing interests will benefit from that funding. We want to make sure you get good information in the months that come ahead on how we can help you bring actionable items to play to help make the plan and its recommendations come to life for New Yorkers. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, thank you for raising that. Um, I can assure you, as someone who raised that issue in the budget negotiating team four years ago, uh, and then we're thrilled uh, to see the mayor include that funding uh, in his executive budget after the council put it in our priorities, our budget priorities, it is really essential that we continue that funding. Uh, absolutely essential. It's a great four-year investment of nearly $100 million. I've spoken to the chancellor a million times. I know we've used that money incredibly well, uh, but we have to continue it. So um, uh, you and I can both do this together. Like. Uh, but, but I'm laser-like focused on it um, and what the challenges are next year uh, for that funding. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank Ginny. You. <clears throat> I'm not ready to go. I'm, little, I'm confused. I'm not sure if I'm going to go off script or on script. Okay. <laughs> Take your time. You have approximately three minutes uh, to figure it out. Um, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you to Chairman Van Bramer and members of the Council and the Committee. My name is Todd Stoll. I'm the Vice President of Education at Jazz at Lincoln Center. This is our 30th anniversary season, and we have grown from three summer concerts to now being the world's largest arts organization dedicated to jazz. In 1996, we became a constituent of Lincoln Center, legitimizing the first original American art form alongside with the ballet, the opera, and the symphony orchestra. 
In 2004, we cut the ribbon on our performance facility, Frederick P. Rose Hall, and each year we present over 100 concerts by the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra along with guests. Making our programming available to traditionally underserved audiences is an organizational imperative. With our education and community outreach programs, we work to ensure that children and adults, regardless of socioeconomic status, have access to world-class jazz programming. I applaud the committee and the city council for the Create NYC plan and thank you for your generosity. Providing arts and cultural programming and support to individuals and organizations in all boroughs is vital to the health of our city and should be a priority for our entire community. We partner with many smaller and grassroots organizations to have greater reach into specific communities and will continue to do so. The work that Jazz League Center has done since the 1990s and continues to do every day, delivering free and low cost educational and community programming to schools and families across the city speaks directly to the key aims and goals of Create NYC. Our education programs are at the core of Jazz League Center's mission. To ensure that jazz will be appreciated and performed both now and in future generations, we connect communities with age appropriate programming that explores this distinctly American art form. The greatest concentration of our programming takes place in New York City public schools, chosen with a focus on those with a large percentage of low-income students and a lack of arts programming. We work very closely with the DOE to choose those schools most in need. During the past academic year of 2017, over 60,000 New York City students and 197 <coughs> schools across the five boroughs took part in one of our education programs. Of these participating schools, 92% received Title I funding. DCA funding allows us to offer a number of programs which are at low cost or no fee. We have one of the largest youth programs dedicated to jazz education in the world with more than 250 students coming each weekend during the school year to study jazz. Our Let Freedom Swing outreach program is in 100 schools but also in a number of community-based organizations, hospitals, and community centers around the city. Our Essentially Ellington program distributes free sheet music to schools throughout the five boroughs as well as the nation and the world, as well as free professional development for teachers interested in teaching jazz. And our Jazz for Young People concerts, based on Leonard Bernstein's original Young People's concerts, provide low-cost tickets for nearly 9,000 students each year. I have included a breakout sheet with programming divided by program, school, and council districts on this testimony. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify, and we look forward to doing more jazz programming across the greater New York area. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, and let me compliment you on the attached uh, documents. Um, first of all, for choosing uh, some really amazing schools in my district uh, to serve, um, uh, but also to uh, encourage you uh, uh, in the hat that I used to wear before I got elected to make sure uh, that all of the council members who are in this document see this document um, uh, to, so that they know the work that you're doing uh, in their districts. I'm sure you're already doing that, but uh, uh, it, is, it is terrific. I read through both uh, of them, and uh, it's impressive. Uh, obviously, we're big fans, um, but uh, uh, thank you for, uh, for the work that you're doing and, and for getting into all of uh, the boroughs and all of these schools. Uh, that's terrific work. Thank you. Jenny, do we have a, a resolution to the situation? Yeah, I'm going to read, and I just want you to know that what you have is longer than what I'm saying. Then I will be reading along with you. And no, don't read it because it's going to confuse you because I'm totally off script with a new script. Oh, we're going script. off script. Okay. I'm on a new script. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Ginny Lalutis. I'm the Executive Director of Art New York, the service and advocacy organization for New York City's 380 nonprofit theaters, two of whom are CIGs. I would like to thank Council Majority Leader Van Bramer for organizing this hearing on Create New York City, and I want to thank you, as always, for not only fighting to increase the DCLA budget, but for succeeding. Um, you are sometimes a lone voice out there, and thank God for you. All of us at Art New York applaud the council, the mayor, and of course the commissioner and his staff for this ambitious and important undertaking. Reading the plan was truly humbling. And as the leader of a cultural organization, I'm committed to working with all involved to activate many of the goals. Um, as some of you may know, Art New York has led the way on creating affordable um, office and rehearsal space. We have 40 offices, we have several rehearsal studios. 
I think one of the greatest contributions the city of New York made towards affordability of theater space was the creation of the Art New York Theaters, which opened in January of this year. The two theaters are rented out to members at below market rates, and we give them free state-of-the-art lighting and sound and video equipment, and boy, are they using it. In response to the DCLA 2016 diversity study, we created two creative opportunity fellowships to create pipelines to leadership positions for administrators of color. Last year, we began working with Beth Prevoy, the 2015 recipient of the Kennedy Center Arts and Disability Award, who taught a cohort from the 4th Street Arts Block how to make small but meaningful changes to their organizations in order to become more physically accessible. Each theater came up with a disability plan which received seed funding for implementation. This year, we'll be offering two cohorts with Ms. Prevor. In addition, we're offering two workshops on what are called relaxed performances. Open to the general public, relaxed performances welcome people who are on the autism spectrum. We provide pre-show information, train companies to reduce noise and harsh light, allow audience members to move and speak, create a space for them to go during, during the performance, and this way, these individuals can experience theater in a welcoming way with the general public. This summer, we received funding to launch Diversifying Our Organizations, a program that will be led by the Rabin Group's diversity, equity, and inclusion practice. The program's goal is to, over the course of three years, work with many of our members to help them diversify their staff and boards. Through our work with the Rabin Group, we have learned that the process of organizational diversification must come from the top and takes time. Um, and this is where I'm going to digress. I have to say I was really disappointed to hear the commissioners say that the CDF proposal is going to immediately ask us about diversity, equity, and inclusion statistics, but that the cultural institution groups are going to have a year to talk about it. It just seems a little unfair. The plan also states that DCLA will seek to provide funding to many community-based cultural organizations identified through their research. This is fantastic, but given the budget where 80% of the agency's funding goes to the CIGs, how will this be funded? And I'm just going to say one thing I like about the plan that hasn't been raised. We applaud the plan's goal to leverage private investment in arts funding and hope that DCLA will open doors that for too long have been closed to most of us, corporations. So many corporations are able to attract talent because of the city's rich cultural offerings. It's not their civic duty to invest. It's good business. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Ginny, and uh, the point that you mentioned I will raise with the, the commissioner. Thank you. Um, uh, without a doubt, um, uh, as usual, very compelling um, from you, and, uh, and I trust where you're coming from. So uh, thank you all uh, very much uh, for being here. Our next panel is Karen Atlas, Christopher Carroll, Lane Harwell, and Antonio Serna. And we have two more panels after this, so if you're still waiting, I have you here. Just two more panels of four. Uh, Antonio, okay. Uh, why don't we start with Karen and work our way down to Antonio in that order. Amazingly, you sat in the order that I called you. Very, very good panel. Thank you, Karen. To um, email you my testimony. Um, my name's Karen Atlas, and I direct Arts and Democracy and Naturally Occurring Cultural Districts New York, NOCDNY. And, um, NOCDNY was a partner uh, with the Hester Street uh, team um, with a focus on community engagement for the cultural plan. Uh, we were really moved and excited about the commitment that communities across New York made to weighing in on the planning process. New Yorkers really care about arts and culture in neighborhoods across the city, and they want to continue to be listened to. And they're committed to making arts and culture an integral part of a just and equitable city. I want to highlight some ways that Arts and Democracy and NOCDNY think this can happen. The first is equity. The planning process made visible the wealth of arts and culture in neighborhoods in all five boroughs. For New York to truly fulfill its commitment to equity, it needs to support the small cultural organizations that make up the full diversity of the city. This includes 
increased funding to address historic inequities, multi-year general support so programs and community relationships can be sustained, valuing the leadership, expertise, diverse aesthetics, and cultural traditions, and not equating small with lack of capacity, and recognition and support for the powerful neighborhood networks. It means decreasing barriers that are particularly challenging for small organizations, aligning deadlines between DCLA and local arts councils, opening up DCLA to fiscally sponsored organizations, and streamlining permits and insurance. Second, I want to reinforce the importance of recognizing the leadership of the field, which was well documented during the cultural planning process through its recommendations and white papers and convenings. Some of the best examples of cross-sector social justice work are initiated by the field and happen organically in our neighborhoods. Artists and cultural organizations played a key role post-Sandy, and the roundtable we had about this during the cultural plan demonstrated the possibilities for uh, partnerships with city agencies. Artists and cultural organizations bring people together to, to address challenging issues like human rights and racial justice and are playing a key role in activating civic participation at a time people want to get involved but face growing political polarization. The Youth Forum we organized with El Puente was a great example of how easily young people are connecting arts, culture, and community activism. NOCDNY is leading a citywide project with over 27 partners about further integrating arts and culture in public housing communities. The roundtable we had focused on the cultural plan and the community forum you hosted and council member Levin hosted made clear that there are exemplary practices, policy recommendations, and opportunities and a commitment to our community to make it happen. And I have one more sentence. Can I finish that? Um, this requires an investment in infrastructure and programs that support the creativity of public housing residents in an ongoing manner, such as reopening the community center at Gowanus Houses, as well as community partnerships and sustained artist residencies. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, uh, Karen. And obviously you've, you've seen and, and heard and know a little bit about some of the targeted funding that was allocated this year. Um, uh, obviously, you're familiar with the Cultural Immigrant Initiative, but, but in the way that we are allocating the increases this year with a heavy emphasis increases on the smaller organizations, um, does that address some of what you're talking about? I realize it doesn't address all of it. Yes, it does. And one thing I didn't get to say is we ask you to consider a council initiative around public housing as a possibility. Um, it, um, but yes, um, I feel like the council has very much, and I think that there are increases, and we were glad to see that in the plan, but we think it can go further. Yeah, and, and I would welcome, obviously, and love to see a council initiative, a cultural council initiative, focusing on public housing. As you know, we, we um, uh, stopped entertaining new initiatives a couple years ago, but we are thrilled that while we were doing those, we got a couple of really important cultural initiatives in, um, like the Cultural Immigrant and Sukasa, um, in addition to increase in CASA every year. But, but I would love to work on that as well. Um, and Christopher. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Bramer. Um, it is a pleasure to be providing testimony today, and I, uh, my name is Christopher Carroll. I'm the political director at Local 802, the American Federation of Musicians. Um, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify, and um, I'm abbreviating our testimony. I've provided uh, longer testimony in writing. Um, a comprehensive cultural plan has ever been more important than it is today, and uh, we commend the, the mayor, uh, the council and the commissioner for taking the, some of the challenges the artists face head on. Um, as you know, many musicians, students, emerging musicians, and even established art, artists struggle to make and build a career that is economically sustainable and artistically fulfilling. The mayor's office of media and entertainment has found that the median income for musicians is $30,000 a year. Mm -hmm. uh, the Center for Urban Future has found that musicians and singers make uh, less than the national median uh, income when adjusted for the cost of living. Um, across the nation. 
this is not a viable way to preserve our artistic communities or our unique neighborhood fabric. This makes our city's first cultural plan particularly important. And as the plan has taken shape, we've been pleased to see that the, council, the city has shown a strong support for both expanding and improving access to the arts citywide, as well as promoting the fair wages and treatment that will help all allow New Yorkers to, to New, allow New York to remain a magnet for many of the greatest musicians in the world. Uh, but create NYC should not be seen as a prescriptive plan or a strategy. It's a set of recommendations, values, priorities. It's a vision document and a roadmap. Uh, one that must be used to guide future development, future policy, and future legislation. Though the plan is impressive in vision, it at times lacks specificity, both in policy recommendations and implementation strategies. And as a result, it is a responsibility of the city council, arts advocates, uh, and throughout the five boroughs and the city to hold the city themselves accountable for these priorities, to ensure that the recommendations, the objectives, the strategies that have been identified are achieved. To accomplish this, the administration must identify how it will determine success. Uh, we must determine what the benchmarks are going to be. Uh, and we must uh, be prepared and eager to, or the, as a member of the Citizens Advisory Committee, Local 802, uh, is prepared and eager to help in this process as, uh, as our countless advocates across the city. Create NRC is an advocacy tool. It's one that should be used to prioritize and rationalize future legislation that supports the arts. As members of this committee, we are constantly heard one extremely important theme throughout the city's public engagement process. That's that the arts are, it's not uh, affordable to create art in New York City. Housing and workspace is too expensive. Wages are too low. The arts, artists are finding themselves under increasing financial pressure to either leave or find a career outside of the arts altogether. We must therefore prioritize legislation and policies that address affordability, both for the cost of living and the wages that are, the artists pay to make that living. Um, uh, and I went ahead and actually read um, uh, the rest of your testimony, so it's an incredibly important uh, series of, of paragraphs that come after that. So thank you um, for that, and, and um, we'll continue to get into that very important you. critical issue of affordability uh, and artists uh, uh, feeling driven out by and And luckily the there are a lot of tools that the city has at its disposal that can actually help create a, an environment that artists can uh, live in right. uh, and create art in rather than doing other things that then become a hobby. Absolutely. Uh, and I just want to uh, uh, compliment you. Um, I actually read uh, the magazine that uh, 802 <laughs> sends out. Uh, it's called Allegra. That's right. And uh, in your column, uh, I, I read as well. So oh, um, thank you, thank you I know much. a lot of folks <laughs> send things out to, to uh, all of us <laughs> in the council, and you're like, do they ever look at this stuff? Do they ever read this stuff? Uh, I actually try and go through uh, all of my mail, and, and um, I just happened to read uh, your article yesterday or the day before. So. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and... Lane to talk a little bit about Dance NYC. Is this on? Thank you, Chair Van Bremer. Um, Executive Director of Dance NYC, a member of the Cultural Affairs Advisory Commission, uh, and uh, like Sheila, uh, a board member of New Yorkers for Culture and the Arts, uh, I congratulate the city on its first ever cultural plan and commend the city for engaging nearly 200,000 New Yorkers through the planning process. I'm pleased by how significantly the plan builds on research and recommendations delivered by partners such as Dance NYC. Uh, in particular, first year priorities include increased funding with a focus on individual artists as recommended by the Advancing Fiscally Sponsored Artists and Arts Projects Report that I've, I've handed you there. Published this spring by Dance NYC with nine fiscal sponsor partners including Brooklyn Arts Council and NIFA which presented today. Uh, and an expanded diversity, equity, inclusion agenda that expressly addresses disability and disability artistry, uh, as has been called for by Dance NYC's work uh, and partners such as a new Disability Arts NYC task force, DANT. The plan also advances priorities for affordable workspace for artists and increased arts education that are important to Dance NYC. Uh, for us, it's a significant milestone, but it's also a launching pad for strengthened and new advocacy. With the city's vision for a sustainable, inclusive, and equitable sector in place, it is now, as Chris has suggested, incumbent upon the city to operationalize that vision. 
uh, fund it at adequate levels and baseline that funding uh, and establish benchmarks and measure progress over time. As the city uh, establishes its evaluation framework, I strongly advocate for tracking the success of each planning strategy by creative discipline to ensure that the art form of dance, as well as all of our peer disciplines, is equitably served. The reality of how greatly artists' needs and opportunities differ by discipline is underscored by Dance NYC's latest report, Advancing Fiscally Sponsored Dance Makers, which shows the chronic undersupply of dance rehearsal space reaching a crisis point. Among the planning successes that can already be counted is a strengthened, louder, and more collaborative arts advocacy community. I'm incredibly impressed by the work of the People's Cultural Plan, and happy to see so many representatives here today to tackle the challenge of inequity in, cult in, uh, in arts and culture, of dance to create a platform for disability arts, uh, and of the New York City Artists Coalition uh, and partners uh, in the Let NYC Dance campaign to advance local law, 1652, to amend the existing cabaret licensing law and advance creativity and free expression. It's time to let NYC dance. In celebrating Create NYC, I thank Chair Van Bramer, uh, Council Member Stephen Lem Levin, who, who set this in motion, uh, and the whole New York City uh, Council for its vision uh, I thank the commissioner who spoke earlier and all who contributed to the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Lane. I was wondering when the cabaret law was going to come up um, yes. uh, today, and uh, there it goes. Um, uh, I'm meeting with the coalition. Anytime. <laughs> meeting with some folks in the coalition tomorrow. Um, so I look forward to that. Uh, and thank you for uh, uh, the reports. I love uh, the fact. Uh, that uh, Danton OAC always produces these amazing, really important uh, Thank you. reports. Thank you. Last but not least, on this panel. Good morning, uh, Chairperson Van Bramer and members of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and Interna International Intergroup Relations. My name is Antonio Serna. I'm an artist and cultural worker, member of Artists of Color Block, a group working to address the intersectional conditions of artists, workers, and communities of color. Uh, and more recently, uh, a member of the People's Cultural Plan with a focus on labor equity and artist equity. Thank you once again for inviting the public and, the work and working class artists like myself to address our concerns regarding the production of culture and all that it entails in New York City. I would like to also extend this thanks to Deputy Commissioner Edwin Torres and the Department of Cultural Affairs for meeting with our group to discuss our recommendations for the cultural plan. Judging by the language used around such issues as labor and equity throughout the Cultural City Plan, it is clear that the Department of Cultural Affairs was indeed listening, and for this we are thankful. Within the cultural plan, there are several positive sections that stand out for me as an artist and cultural worker of color. Specifically, the increased support for historically underrepresented cultural workers and producers, inclusive of artists and art arts organizations, page 78. Uh, the support for educators and teaching artists, page 123. And employment and career development for cultural workers, uh, again, of color, and page uh, 89. So as we move into a new chapter for the Create New York City plan, I would like to make two suggestions. First, that we put in place a transparent and accountable framework for achieving these goals, as I mentioned above. As a working class artist, we don't always have the time or the resources to follow up and crunch all the numbers that will hopefully point towards improvements throughout the city. It would be great that this data and detailed reports are equal, easily accessible. Secondly, that issues re that remained unresolved in the first draft are re-examined wholeheartedly. Issues like gentrification that seem to be out of the purview of this department and which can easily be linked in one effortless phrase, displacement destroys culture. If somehow this connection is hard to understand, let me explain to you that in the last decade and a half, we have seen the level of homelessness in New York City double from about 30,000 to nearly 60,000. Family in New York City's homeless shelters uh, uh, went from spending six months to, over, to now over one year in these shelters. 
the majority of which are dis is disproportionately affecting black and Latino communities. Uh, if this department and council does in fact seek to provide culture for everyone in New York, they should seriously consider partnering with other departments and commissions to halt this displacement. I speak from a first-hand experience as a person of color, first-generation Mexican-American who moved here more than 20 years ago and is still constantly struggling with low-paying jobs, student debt, rent burden, evictions, medical bills, welfare, and all to, to just to, to, to create all this. It's, taking, it's making it difficult for me to create the thing I moved here for, uh, a, a, a constant struggle for me. Uh, I, I can cut this off. Then. Yep, I, I uh, uh, went ahead and, and read the last uh, two paragraphs of your, your statement as well. Um, more on gentrification, obviously, uh, very important stuff. So um, let me say thank you. I, I, uh, uh, I think this is very constructive uh, recommendations and, and, and you know, criticisms of, of the department and of, of, of the plan. Um, but uh, but also uh, uh, I do appreciate the concern for uh, the homeless and uh, and that uh, issue and um, uh, I'm fairly certain that if uh, Tom Finkel Pearl um, thought he had the solution to that he would let us know um, but but I I but I get the point that we all have a role to play in in addressing those very important issues right I think the Department of Cultural Affairs. And even this committee alone are, are not going to solve the, the homelessness crisis. But but I get the the connectivity uh, um, to the issues that you're talking about and yes, and um, uh, and where that goes. I, I just want to add that there there is ways to have cultural impact studies to kind of see how you would be displacing Latino and black cultures from communities that would then uh, prevent displacement and development in those communities. I mean, it's, 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 it's been done in other cities sure. like, like Portland. So I don't see why it can't happen in New York City. Absolutely. Um, uh, I, I agree. And we'll take a look at that Portland uh, um, study, uh, unless you want to send it to me. Uh, I'd be happy to look at that. Um, thank you very much uh, to this panel uh, for your input, and we have a few more. Um, did we take a dance wave out? No, no, no. Okay, all right. So we have, uh, is Joanna Crispy still here, or Crisp? You'll let me know how I said that name, uh, correctly or incorrectly. Uh, is it Ben Davis? Ben Davis? From the People's Cultural Plan, did Ben uh, Ben is still here? Okay. Uh, Robert Lee, Robert Lee. Looks like Robert Lee. It may not be from the Asian America Art Center. Great. And Diane Duker. All right. And then uh, we have uh, one last panel uh, after that, which includes uh, Simon Dove and Javier Madrano, and looks like Olympia. Kazi, if uh, those folks are here. All right. Um, why don't we start with you? And we'll go right down the line. Thank you, Councilmember Van Bramer. Uh, oh. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Joanna Crisp and I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Education at the Municipal Arts Society of New York. The Municipal Arts Society of New York congratulates the Department of Cultural Affairs on producing a comprehensive cultural plan that reflects an extensive community engagement process. MAS was pleased to contribute to this process, informing community stakeholders about opportunities to participate in the drafting of the plan through our 2017 Livable Neighborhoods Program Workshop Series. 
Because of MAS's focus on New York City's built environment, we particularly applaud the strategies that DCLA has identified to address issues of affordability, neighborhood character, and arts and culture in public space. The cultural plan makes a stated commitment to implementing processes that will increase local participation in the planning, design, and programming of current and future city-owned properties designated for cultural use. We urge the city to look at the 22% of properties under their management which are classified as having no current use for this purpose. Many of these properties are located in neighborhoods that the University of, of Pennsylvania's Social Impact of the Arts Project identifies as falling below New York City averages in terms of cultural assets and other social well-being indicators. The plan also commits to increasing the development of appropriate, affordable, accessible housing and workspaces. MAS is supportive of the plan's intention of exploring the potential of new long-term affordability models that combat displacement, especially community land trusts and rent-to-own options. The cultural plan will endeavor to support neighborhood-based efforts to identify, catalog, and protect locally significant cultural assets. Initiatives like Place Matters, a collaboration between MAS and City Lore, and the Neighborhood Creative and Cultural Asset Mapping Capacity Building work conducted by MAS in partnership with the National Consortium for Creative Placemaking uh, and with support from the Department of Cultural Affairs, provide good examples. MAS is also supportive of DCLA's commitment uh, within the neighborhood character issue area to increase coordination with DCP, HPD, and EDC to proactively engage local artists as well as arts and cultural organizations in neighborhood planning and rezoning processes. MAS is in favor of the continued expansion of the Percent for Art program to provide for the maintenance of completed projects on city-owned property. We encourage DCLA to also consider the model of the Philadelphia Redevelopment Authority's Percent for Art program, the oldest in the country, which includes an option for the provision of space for artists and arts organizations in fulfillment of their 1% requirement. The cultural plan also pledges to facilitate more artist-led projects in collaboration with city agencies. MAS has a history of fostering cross-sector collaborative projects, uh, such as the effort to restore Barry Faulkner's mural series in Washington Irving Hi High School. With the New York City Department of Education, the Public Design Commission, conservators, and the school's faculty and students. Uh, we have experienced firsthand the multiple benefits of these types of collaborations and would welcome the opportunity to be a resource for the city as they continue in this work. Um, we look forward to details around implementation. Um, and just one final point, uh, while the engagement uh, that took place in the drafting process was very impressive, uh, I think it's safe to say that most New Yorkers are still to learn about the plan and, and the impact that it will have on their neighborhoods. So continued engagement uh, with the public will be really critical. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, and really appreciate the recommendation on the Present for Art program uh, and Philadelphia's uh, program. We will. Uh, um, see if we can make that happen in New York City. Uh, next. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Ben Davis and I'm an independent writer, um, but I've been part of this initiative, this very inspiring initiative called the People's Cultural Plan along with several other people on this panel and many other people throughout the city. I think it's very easy in a, a hearing like this and in a report like this to fall into this kind of anodyne, bleached out language about displacement and affordability. And I think it's, it's worth saying, it's, it's stating that we are in the middle of a crisis. I'm not going to go into that um, um, very deeply because I think most of us should be able to feel it. But I could go to a different meeting about an artist being displaced or a small community organization being displaced almost every day. There's a real urgency to this moment. And it is that urgency that I think needs to be amplified in the city's cultural plan as it's going forward. The goals around diversity and um, cultural funding equity in the plan, I think, are to be applauded and very good. The proof of the, of the pudding is in the eating, however. We'd like to see the goals be much more ambitious and I have to echo my colleague Anthony Cerner that it's all about the framework going forward. We want to see the Department of Cultural Affairs document its progress towards these goals and publish their figures openly. In his testimony, cultural, uh, Commissioner Finkelpearl um, said that the number one um, issue that came up in all of the conversations, the many, many conversations around the city's cultural plan, was around affordability. It is very notable then that the affordability, what they call the affordability and what I would call the displacement section of this report, is the most vague and unsatisfying um, part. 
Every single practical strategy listed there is listed as medium or long-term implementation. Not a single one is immediate in implementation, meaning there is literally no sense of urgency in the cultural plan as it exists. The suggestions, furthermore, that it does include are not bold enough. It mentions the area or affordable real estate for artists initiative, which plans to build um, 500 affordable housing units in a decade. Just to give you an example, 53,000 people applied for 89 spots in an affordable artist complex um, a couple of years ago. The need is incredibly deep. I know that the uh, uh, response of the uh, uh, committee such as this one will probably be that the Department of Cultural Affairs doesn't have jurisdiction over um, housing matters that is beyond their purview. And I just want to say that that um, that is not thinking boldly enough, again, for the, uh, the state of urgency that we live in. When the city thinks it's in its interest, it has the ability to do very imaginative, imaginative things. To give you an example, uh, they gave tax breaks to a developer in order to um, open New York's first tax uh, free trade zone where rich people can store their art tax-free. In Harlem, I believe, they just placed a church to do that. So that shows you the kind of imagination that is possible when people think it is in their interest. The cultural plan, the city's cultural plan, as I understand it, is a set of recommendations for the council. It is an advocacy document. Its advocacy has to be bolder. The Small Business Job Survival Act, for instance, which would actually slow displacement of artists from workplaces, and as well as small businesses in general, has been in city council for a long time. It should, you should advocate it. People should advocate it. If we don't take much bolder action and seize on this opportunity, which I believe is a real opportunity, then this plan will just become a way of feeling better about ourselves as the cultural city, as the cultural life of our city bleaches out around us. Uh, thank you. Uh, very passionately uh, delivered, and um, uh, I appreciate your your point of view and your perspective and your testimony. I read. Uh, through it, obviously you were you were jumping around a little bit, but I uh, appreciate uh, um, everything that's in here, and you know we uh, we will follow up on a lot of the uh, issues that you raise with the the reports and the follow through. Um, there needs to be implementation uh, framework for the things that are in there, and for the things that aren't in there around, it is impossible to have cultural justice without going beyond the narrow frame of culture. You have to address displacement, and that means, and that means addressing the real estate industry. You can't please everybody. Uh, I appreciate that, thank you. Next, Robert. I wanna thank you, uh, Chairman Van Bremer, for initiating this uh, talk. I want to uh, reinforce the urgency that you've just heard. Um, I live in Chinatown, and uh, I've spoken to people who have lived there as long as I have, or longer, and uh, they don't expect Chinatown to continue to exist for another 10, 20 years, the way things are going. Um, let me get back to trying to read a, a bits and parts of what I've given you. Um, after decades of a history of benign neglect, racism, discrimination suffered by the POC artists and cultural community, a resolution to this problem was sought through listening to the needs and concerns of all those affected. Given the CIG started to, even the CIG started to worry publicly their funds might be shifted to POC organizations, people of color organizations, reversing 40 years of documented inequity. With the completion of the Create NYC plan, that promise has now died. Asian American Art Center was one of those who saw in this an opportunity that had been impossible for 40 years. After nearly two years of listening to New Yorkers and, and the publication of an extensive record of such interactions, the city has demonstrated it fails to listen where listening counts. Asian American Art Center and a thousand other org art organizations, communities and boroughs they serve, our voices go unrecognized. Instead, the lion's share of funding to CIG has been reinscribed, their fundings assured, and 67% of New York City uh, as people of color, their homes, their neighborhoods, are left to the real estate developers. Opportunity in America reigns for developers as the people get priced out of their homes and their neighborhoods. 
at the Cultural Equity Conference held in April 2015, sponsored by the Cultural Equity Group, of which I am a member, I started the need, I stated the need to recognize the value of multiple cultures, especially traditional wisdom bearers who should be honored, recognized, as well as the elder nonprofit cultural organizations, many of these begun in the civil rights era, whose community infrastructure has grown priceless in their value to the city of New York as a roadmap to cultural transition. At the New York Community Trust Gathering held in the Museo del Barrio in November of last year, I spoke again of these elder community organizations, how their need for succession funding was crucial for their continued survival. City officials like Tom Finkelpearl were present at both of these events. The city listens, however, it listens selectively. Now, today, three years, uh, uh, three of these elder POC organizations are dying as our mayor fiddles with the number of people of color on the staff of CIG organizations. I'll just read one section sure. that at the end, or towards the end, in speaking with artists who live in countries where limits to artistic freedom is explicit, some, counts, some counsel that their situation is not so bad. Once, as artists, you accept your role and that desperate times require desperate measures. I think it was many, many years ago that uh, Du Bois said that the country simply needs to get to know each other. And this opportunity was a great opportunity for us to wake up and hear that again. And unfortunately, we see that that potential to change the country was not met. Uh, I'm sorry you uh, feel uh, uh, that way. Um, I understand that it didn't uh, entail all of the changes that you would certainly have wanted to see. But um, I hope that there's. Uh, uh, evidence in the report of at least some of us listening in the sense that we are uh, really prioritizing funding for small organizations and that is really where we directed the bulk of of, of all of the new funding so um, but I appreciate what, what you're saying very much so thank you thank you sir Although the mayor's plan has revealed the need for greater cultural equity in the leadership and workforce of the city's CIG Just, groups. Uh, state your name for the record. Okay, hi. My name is Diane Frayer. I'm from Osage and Cherokee Nations, um, founder and director of Amarinda, and um, I'm also a New Yorker. <laughs> um, and a filmmaker also as well as an artist. Although the mayor's plan has revealed the need for greater cultural equity in leadership and and in the workforce of the city's CIG groups, it has done nothing to address the rampant discriminatory and exclusionary practices of the pseudo elite nonprofit arts complex against artists of color and ethnicity. Indeed, it condoned these practices while rolling out the cultural plan and continues to abdicate all responsibility for continuance of them in city owned property. For over 30 years, Amarinda has provided an avenue for Native American artists to present their work with dignity as central storytellers and creators of our own experience. Located in Community Board 3 for all of our existence, we have been in search of a location within our greater community for a very long time. When 122 Community Center announced the availability of three spaces as a not-for-profit arts organization with a long history of excellence, we applied. The announcement and application process indicated that there were three spaces available for nonprofit community based organizations to apply for consideration and that there could be more than one organization accepted. On August 20th of this year, we received a letter that indicates that all three spaces have been awarded to one organization, Movement Research. 
the city-owned space that has been provided at a third of market rate to 122cc to manage by New York City should uphold the inclusion of the cultural arts diversity of organizations in New York City and the community. They have not, and even in spite of the fact that DCLA and the District 2 City Council member were on the selection committee and the city owns the building. Indeed, when Deputy Commissioner Edwin Torres, then Deputy Commissioner Eddie Torres, informed us in a meeting in 2016 that the city's covenant with 122CC allowed them to select new tenants, but DCLA had the final approval. We so hope that this included preventing discriminatory and exclusionary practices against us. It has also come to our attention that the selection of whom the space was to be awarded was a predetermined outcome decided before the announcement of the RFP. So all the applicants for the spaces in the building were victims of a fraudulent process with a predetermined outcome all wasted precious limited organizational resources because of a paradigm of pri white privilege. The residents in, that, in 122 and now movement research reflect a narrow artistic vision not including organizations created and run by people of color and ethnic diversity that makes this wonderful city unique. Okay. Uh, it is uncomprehensible that 2,825 square feet of space be of, uh, afforded one organization. There is no financial, professional, or legal justification for this exclusionary practice towards. It is also the second time that we have been treated in an, in an inequitable and fraudulent manner by a non-diverse arts consortium occupying city-owned property. When we protest these practices, we receive no re remedy or relief. Diane, I, I'm uh, familiar with the issue. I've, I've read through um, uh, your testimony, and, and uh, while I understand that, that uh, you connect this to Create NYC and the cultural plan, um, I also understand it's a very, very specific uh, uh, awarding of, uh, of space uh, to an organization other than yourself that you are very concerned about, and I've seen uh, some letters to this effect, and, and uh, I'm aware that you take great exception to the Department of Cultural Affairs and, and uh, uh, to how um, this space was assigned or chosen. So, um, so I want to just say thank you for that, but also uh, um, I read the rest and uh, I understand your position and where you're coming from in terms of this issue and that you are um, very unhappy with, uh, with how, this was, how this went down. Um, so um, I will. Sir, may I have permission to, uh, the, on behalf of the community who asked me, um, to, to state two things that we affirm before the council yes, today? That, may I, I have permission? actually read that, and it's important that you say that if you would like, yes. Yes, both Amarinda Inc. and the American Indian Community House, which is a social service agency serving the tribally and rural community, both affirm the following. We are the direct living descendants of the people whom Columbus first murdered and stole their land, signatories to treaties between our sovereign native nations and the United States government. If the city cannot meet with us and support our current urgent request for a modest amount of space, do not pimp the Native American community over a statue of Columbus in order to play a thinly disguised race card in an election year. The second thing we affirm is that no one can legitimately represent tribally enrolled communities unless they are from these recognized communities, known by and accountable to them. We are honored to work with other unaffiliated indigenous communities as they represent their own constituents and uphold the principle that each community can only represent themselves unless prior informed consent is sought and approved. Thank you, um, uh, Diane. Thank you, all of you, to the panel for being here and uh, participating and for your input. Uh, our last panel, if uh, folks are still here, uh, Simon Dove, um, Javier Medrano, and Olympia Kazi, it looks like. I hope I'm saying that right. Yes.
last panel with the last of the water. Is there no more water? Do we need more water? You've waited long enough. The least we could do is give you a proper glass of water. <laughs> we can share ours. We've had very little, yes. Thank you. If you need, re if you need reinforcements, we'll just we'll leave that jug there, and then. <laughs> Who wants to start? Is that you, Simon? Um, I can start. Um, and two glasses of water, this better be good. <laughs> I'm good, two drinks is enough. Um, <laughs> Chair Van Bremer and uh, what should I say, absent members, thank you so much for this opportunity to testify today. My name is Simon Dove, I'm executive and artistic director of Dancing in the Streets, based, um, based now in the Bronx since 2011, established in 1984. We warmly welcome the long overdue strategic arts and culture plan for New York City. The document, Create NYC, a cultural plan for all New Yorkers, however, falls somewhat short of its ambitious subtitle. The primary issue that Create NYC correctly identifies is the profound need for equity and inclusion in cultural provision. I could not agree more. Yet, the proposal to increase resources to existing CIG institutions in low-income areas does not address the problem. It simply perpetuates it. This action will undoubtedly help the statistics around cultural spend in each borough, but it will not impact the artists and communities who live there that have been ignored for so long. We advocate changing practice on the ground, not statistics in reports. The City Council must begin to recognize and embrace the reality that most residents' cultural experiences do not take place in CIGs or even in designated arts buildings. Citizens' cultural practices happen everywhere throughout the city, and it is not simply a matter of making things or products for exhibition or performance, but rather it's a process of ongoing creative exploration and community celebration, ideally facilitated by artists who can afford to be in long-term relationships with the communities in which they work. This arts activity, known as social practice, brings artists and communities together in long-term and sustained relationships, offering a profound level of engagement, stimulating creativity, as well as individual and community development. The benefits that ensue are well known. It builds community resilience, it develops positive intergenerational and cross-community relationships, and it stimulates overall community health and well-being. Let us then try to collectively to imagine how a system of interdepartmental public investment can be developed, which is much closer to the communities in which the artists work. It's about long-term creative relationships. It supports ongoing creative process, not simply product making. It connects with housing initiatives, enabling artists to afford to live in the communities in which they work. It dovetails with community services around health and wellness. It's delivered where people live and work, and it's in buildings and public spaces where they feel welcome without any economic or physical barriers. The commissioner writes in his intro to the plan that this plan signals the beginning of a new conversation. Let me assure you that artists and arts organizations in the South Bronx, together with the communities they work, are keenly awaiting to begin this new conversation. If we can really figure this out, to use the commissioner's words, New York City will be truly supporting its artists and its communities, and not just its grand buildings. Thank you. Chair Van Bremer, members of the City Council, thank you for the opportunity to discuss New York City's comprehensive cultural plan, Create NYC. I am Javier Medrano, Senior Associate of Public and Private Partnership at the Third Avenue Business Improvement District in the South Bronx. The district represents the oldest commercial corridor in the Bronx with over 200 businesses and soon to grow to 1,200 businesses, while also serving over 200,000 residents daily. The district is home to a rich, rooted in arts and culture. Indeed, at the turn of the century, there are more theaters, dance halls, culture enclaves in, in our quarter than what we have along the famed theater now row in Manhattan today. 
founded in 1988 to protect businesses and grow community during the period of the Bronx economic decline, our mission and purpose to always lead by demanding equity from a city government for an area that has suffered from over four decades of community disinvestment. The Third Avenue Business Improvement District welcomes New York City's first ever cultural plan designed to support artists in all five boroughs, an ambitious initiative that stimulates creativity in our great city while also building upon our economic fabric. While we applaud the effort to, efforts to date and acknowledge the tremendous work completed to bring all stakeholders to the table, the Create NYC Culture Plan does not go far enough to support our local communities and build our local artist-based economies. Quite simply, the plan lacks equity and inclusion and ignores the diversity of our city. And it, and it represents stated that Create NYC plans a solidified anchor by NYC cultural institution groups, 33 publicly owned and privately operated organizations. These organizations include the American Museum of Natural History, Snug Harbor Cultural Center, and Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, just to name a few. Many of these organizations have roots that clearly align this with the city's fund funders and some of the oldest New York City families who serve as a grand benefactor to their various funds. Our district values these important institutions, however, we must also acknowledge that, that by investing such portion of city, city cultural funds in these historic institutions that we are giving the city of New York the right to whitewash largely minority and disenfranchised communities that we hope that these grand organizations will learn to serve. The plan does not invest in cultural equity and it does not empower the local artists and community. We must recognize that work, that work local artists have done and elevate that work to the highest platform. Often that pl platform is not, a is not a performance or an exhibit, exhibition or an opening, but rather an investment in the artists or the community that they represent. We must, we must move away from classifying culture within the confined spaces and realize just as one may enjoy a Renoir at the Met, one might also enjoy the local artist's street mural. London historic institution must be democratized. We must also recognize the value of local artist icons that brings to New York City. I can try. Does Third Avenue get any cultural funding? Do you yourselves do cultural programming? Well, right now we're going to have a Romento Clemente Plaza opening up across from our offices. Mm -hmm. We've been working with the mayor's office, and that has been in the works for like almost 10 years. And we were planning on having a performance on the 23rd, but the plaza hasn't been finally constructed. Mm. So we are promoting arts and culture in our area. Right. And supporting right. our local so you artists. You guys work closely together, huh? Yes. Working with us. Right. Um, no, just to say we're, we're working with the community, so we're trying to em create this framework that I was talking about where you empower artists to work with communities over long periods of sure. time in, sure. uh, in public housing projects, but also develop right. community integration through the arts. But Javier, your group doesn't get like cultural development fund funding, you don't get to part of cultural affairs funding. No, at, we don't. Right. But would you like to? Well, right now we're um, raising funds to create create more projects in the area. Got it. I mean, that would be amazing if we could. Yeah. Uh, we should figure out if there's a way to make that happen. But boy, are you tough on the cultural plan. Um, uh, uh, so, I mean, I, I realize we're, we're, we're at the end of the hearing and, and you know, I don't really, uh, uh, look, everyone's entitled to their own interpretation and their own personal views of the plan. I would just say, there's a lot in both of your testimonies, quite frankly, about sort of uh, art is not confined to a space, uh, but in fact it can happen out on the streets and all that. And I, I, I would just argue we can and we do both in the city of New York right now. Uh, I mean, I, I, I understand part of the argument that you're making, um, uh, which is some people think, not necessarily myself, but the, the things get too much, right? I understand that that's an argument, but I think it's a different argument to say we're not doing any of the other things, right? Um, we're, not, we're not funding all of these small um, uh, organizations 
uh, that are doing the work outside of these 33 buildings, right? I mean, to say that all of the art that's happening in the city that's funded by the city of New York is sort of only going on in these 33 buildings. That's not what you're saying, right? I mean, clearly... Can, can I respond? No, yeah, it, you're dancing in the streets, it, right? Yeah, it's yeah. it's simply that uh, the, the resources currently... It, my sense is the plan seeks to uh, um, find ways in which it can expand current provision. The fact is that 75% of the budget is spent on 33 organizations. So 900 small organizations are supported by 25% of the budget. It's actually the same amount you spend on the lighting and heating bills of the CIGs. And we're saying we need to not look at institutions, we need to look at communities, and a culture plan needs to start not with what exists, but what needs to happen, and how do we get there? Right. So we need a, a, a real roadmap with clear destinations, but a process that is transparent and open, which builds that mechanism. It, it, it's not in the plan. Right, right, and I would also just caution, not all of the SIGs are exactly the same, right? And, and, and so there's, there's a great diversity even within the SIGs. Um, so I, there's a, there's a, I think a, a leap that that uh, they're all the Met, right? And and uh, uh, and look, I think the Met is a is a terrific and very important and valuable institution for our city. But I think, a, we have to 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 agree that there's diversity even within the SIGs, even within the organizations. Uh, uh, and then I would just counter that the budget that we adopted this year. Uh, and all the increases are heavily weighted um, uh, towards smaller organizations, towards those 900 organizations and others that could go into that fund. I, I, uh, I certainly hear your, your feeling about uh, the funding that the SIGs get, but uh, I just want to push back generally because, uh, and I'm really, you know, Javier, and I think, you, I'm, I'm really glad that you're here. I'm really glad that, that I an organization that are not primarily a cultural organization is here to talk about this issue. I think that's great. I wish there were more. Um, but, uh, but I think uh, some of it is, is, is too harsh in a, in a general way about the, the, the plan and about the funding that we provide in, in the City of New York for culture, where I think there is increasingly an awareness and certainly a belief on my part as the chair uh, and the speaker that our funding, our new funding in particular, we know we're driving towards the smaller organizations, uh, the small nonprofits, out of borough, are much more uh, diverse in terms of uh, population and service, um, and targeted service groups. So uh, we're working on that. But but I um, I hear I just wanted to en engage you a little bit there, Javier, because. Um, um, uh, you know, we're, we're, it's, it's, I don't think it's, it's, it's quite um, that simple, but, but I appreciate everything you have to say. I mean, I think the city has its great intention. I don't think it's going far enough. I don't think that we should have these large institutions coming into communities and saying, this is how you can do, create art. I think it should start from the grassroots and from the right. community, and they should, have the first, they should be the ones who are first to have the voice. All right. Um, do you think that art. the large organizations go into communities and say this is how you create art? I mean, I guess from the language from the cultural plan, it's like it might, it might come off, let's, let's say the South Bronx, it's been ignored for so long, mm -hmm. and then yet someone mentioned earlier in gentrification of like this savior perspective of like we're going to come in and we're going to help you out, we're going to do this. But is it, is it really truly helping our community? I think we should really bring it in, into like base organizations and listening to them. Mm -hmm. I guess I would I would just say, can we do both, right? Can 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 we can we agree that you know the Met or the Museum of Natural History or you know Lincoln Center that maybe they genuinely do want to uh, uh, provide their programs and services? Uh, they genuinely might want to reach out. Uh, to communities that maybe have traditionally been excluded or not had those opportunities, um, and and genuinely and, and 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 for the for the good of of society want to provide access to those programs at the same time having those groups that are a small nonprofit you know of the community also right generating art you know producing art um, that that maybe. That maybe the the intentions of all the large groups seeking to serve a more diverse audience 
aren't uh, are bad. Um, and I guess the case that I'd make is that, that both can happen, right? That in communities where, you know, Carnegie Hall wants to provide a program or seeks to provide a free program or, or to get out into communities, um, that that doesn't necessarily exclude, you know, a very small, uh, um, you know, neighborhood-based uh, cultural organization, for example, in Queens, uh, an Ecuadorian dance troupe, that, that that still can't happen in, like, a really authentic way, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess that's what I would just add to that, that, that both can happen together. Um, we're just late in the hearing, so I'm kind of, like, no. engaging <laughs> this panel more, plus you waited three hours to testify, so um, uh, now you'll regret it, but um, uh, I'm happy to, uh, uh, to engage this panel in particular. Um, uh, because you waited so long, and, and, and I want to uh, respect the fact that you, you did wait and you stayed, so you get a little extra time. Um, uh, last but not least. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you also uh, because you, uh, Majority Leader Van Bramer and uh, Council Member Levin, legislated the creation of this very plan that we are here to discuss. So my name is Olympia Kazi, and I'm here uh, to testify on behalf of the New York City Artist Coalition. The Create NYC process is actually the birthplace of our coalition, a group of like-minded people who strongly believe in grassroots cultural spaces, and I did, I know it was a contentious term, I'm going to explain later what I mean by the use of grassroots. Uh, we came together around a meeting with Commissioner Finkelperl and his unflagging DCLA dream, uh, dream team, basically, that's how we, we see them. Uh, thanks to their openness and progressive views, we were able to work together and provide recommendations that are now included in the plan that we're considering today. Our focus has been the safety and preservation of informal, artist, and community-driven spaces. That's the way we interpret grassroots, at least. Um, and uh, that are integral in the thriving diversity and democratic character of our city. Um, this plan is a useful roadmap that contains many great ideas and principles. However, it will be important, as you were just saying, that uh, we continue to work all together across you know, the board, between the city council, the mayor, the nonprofits, funders, advocates, artists, and all the stakeholders, uh, in order to understand the how these issues are going to become a reality. Um, all the issues included in the draft are relevant, and we must act on all fronts. Culture is shaped and by and saves the lives of all New Yorkers. Culture emerges in the way we draft and enforce our policies and laws, in the way we design our education, housing, and health care. As a result, it is crucial that the insights that emerge through this plan inform the programs, services, and policies of all city agencies. And we'll be happy in the future, you know, to explain further what we mean by that. Um, hopeful steps are already being taken. Yesterday night, we attended the signing of the bill to create the Office of Nightlife, and this is one of the pens that the mayor used, and I shared the stage with uh, Marky Ramon, so I feel like that was a special night. We really hope <laughs> that uh, uh, this, you know, new office, that it will, you know, beyond focus on the thriving nightlife, that it will focus on working in preserving grassroots culture and what is important about the multicultural identity of our city. Um, now I cannot miss the opportunity to give a shout out to, you know, the committee members that I have already signed on on the cabaret lorry pill that is included in this plan. Uh, Stephen Levin, who's been, you know, one of our inspirations since the beginning of our work, but also Council Women uh, Rosenthal and Kumbo, and I hope after our meeting tomorrow, Majority Leader Van Bramer. Uh, I mean, there are many reasons to repeal that law, but in conclusion, I just want to say social dancing is not a crime, and we cannot allow any more a prohibition era um, law with racist and homophobic legacy to, to persist. <laughs> uh, so thank you, thank you. Yes, well, um, uh, I look forward to the meeting tomorrow. I appreciate you, uh, um, uh, I appreciate your thoughts on it, and, and, and I, I can certainly say uh, without qualification that as a gay man, I uh, do not support any homophobic uh, <laughs> uh, laws. Um, and uh, I, I love to dance. Um, uh, 
uh, including in the Bronx, by the way. I've danced, <laughs> I've danced a few times in the Bronx. Come on Saturday in the streets. Oh. Do you only dance in the streets? <laughs> Mostly, yeah, it's all we can afford. <laughs> Plus, there is the Cabarello. <laughs> What's that? Plus, there is the Cabarello. We don't know how many licensed spaces they have up there. <laughs> Enough. Um, that's a different hearing altogether. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, uh, thank you uh, uh, all for, uh, for your uh, input. I think it was uh, a meaningful uh, uh, hearing and airing of... Uh, of the plan, and, and I was glad to hear from so many folks. Uh, uh, Dance Wave, unfortunately, uh, had to leave, but uh, they did leave their testimony, and I did take a look at it uh, as well. Um, so we will uh, endeavor to continue to get better uh, and uh, get it more right, although um, I think there is a lot of good news when it comes to culture and the arts in the city of New York. There uh, are a lot of things that we should feel good about, and uh, this plan I believe is one of them. Uh, our funding uh, allocations uh, are also uh, something that we can feel good about. We all want more. We need more. We are fighting for more all the time, and, um, and we certainly need it baselined. And and we definitely want to continue the work of the council and the council's funding. If you look at the council's funding this year, uh, uh, virtually all of it uh, targets smaller. Uh, nonprofit cultural organizations. Um, uh, we're very, very proud of, of all of that work and the funding that's there. And the speaker and I and the council have been really, really determined uh, to create some of those numbers and percentages that you see or will see in what's uh, allocated this year, um, including a 33% increase for groups with budgets of $250,000 or less. Um, that is uh, something that we did that I'm very, very proud of. Um, so with that, uh, thank you to uh, everyone who has uh, spent the last three hours uh, with us, and thank you to the staff. Um, and we will all continue to work together, uh, dance together, and fight together for the arts in the city of New York. Onwards. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.